Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Hello, good evening, everyone. Hey, how's it going? It's going great. I'm sorry, did I interrupt you while you were eating something, Mr. Real? I wasn't eating anything. I was just uh, taking a sip of my nice sweet tea. Ah, the sweet tea. You and Got I look it. like twin brothers today. We do, brothers from another mother. And, <laughs> I'm and, joining. Uh, our <laughs> sister. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Maven, how are you? Woohoo! Hello, yeah. I'm doing well. <laughs> I think um, we're representing something a little different today. Maybe uh, maybe people will notice. I, I doubt anyone guessed that in the chat. I think for you, RFM, you're the one they usually want to guess about. I'm throwing a curveball. Absolutely. We are <laughs> we are speaking with one shirt tonight. And our shirts all say Dartmouth, which I understand is a, is a, a college of some sort back east. Yeah, some barely yeah. known university. Yeah, I mean, a couple people have heard of it probably. <laughs> well, this is the first time I've ever worn a shirt advertising somebody else's university, other than the one I actually went to. I, I heard a few so-called scholars have gone there. <laughs> yes, and they, they it's a pretty good a school. Good in the library, yeah. <laughs> they've got some good books there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's an Ivy League school, and we are so excited tonight. By the way, if you guys want to say anything right now, introductory, you know, the announcements at the beginning of the meeting. Just to, Please do, because I'm ready to go. Okay, just really quick, folks. Uh, just don't forget, when you use Amazon, please use Amazon Smile with Mormon Discussion Incorporated as your designated charity. And a few of those dollars makes its way back to Mormonism Live. So we appreciate that. Otherwise, we're just grateful for everybody who supports the program. And I'm excited about a really cool show tonight. And right, I just we have had a special one. guest. Oh, never mind. It's fine. You, you just had one? one. <laughs> just no, one. No, please, I, please. I didn't ask permission beforehand, but what? Mormon Stories is really close to 100K uh, subscribers. Subscribers, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, We're really so close put Mormon to discussions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, subscribe there's, to us, then subscribe to Mormon Stories. To, no kidding. You're over here hawking for Mormon Stories, maybe. Is this, is this how it's going to be now? We're like, we're like close. Dude. Mormon Stories is as close to 100,000 as we are to zero. They're gross, and we're like tithing on gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. So please subscribe. It is officially a race now. This is the great race, like with Tony Curtis and Natalie Wood and Jack <laughs> Lemon and Peter Falk. So we want to get at Mormonism Live to 100,000 before John DeLynn at that <laughs> other luck. podcast that I can't remember the name of right now. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> sure, we need your, your friends. help. <laughs> yeah, a lot of friends, like hundreds of, yeah, thousands of your friends, please. Will you do that for us? Thank you, Maven. I'm so glad that you you contributed that. Uh, but stay on, because, <laughs> stay on because we got something to okay. set up now. Because our guest is going to be talking about Joseph Smith's secret education, the Dartmouth connection. And I will tell you something that's not going to surprise any of you who've been a member of the church for more than ten seconds. Is that I grew up in this church? Well, after I was baptized when I was 18, back in 1978, and this was a and continues to be a frequent talking point in the church about how, I don't want to say how dumb Joseph Smith was, okay? But let's just say his lack of education. And this was repeatedly brought up because it's always brought, brought up in terms of juxtaposing it with what he accomplished. And usually it's the Book of Mormon because that was one of the first big things he did. And I remember hearing over and over when I was a member of the church and, and going to um, uh, classes and everything, uh, the number three came up a lot, that he had the equivalent of three years of education. And I was always left with the impression of looking back at my first three years of education and thinking Joseph Smith knew everything I knew when I was done with third grade. And it appears that that may not be the case. And that's what our discussion is going to be about tonight with Dr. Randall Bell. But before that, can we play the clip from my friend and yours, Tad Collister? 
because recently he gave a talk in general conference. It's just about 40 seconds long. But once again, he hits this theme at the beginning of his talk where he's talking about how Joseph Smith never could have produced the Book of Mormon in a million years because he just didn't have the education. Do you have that? Yep. The critics must explain how Joseph Smith, a 23-year-old farm boy with limited education, created a book with hundreds of unique names and places, as well as detailed stories and events. Accordingly, many critics propose that he was a creative genius who relied upon numerous books and other local resources to create the historical content of the Book of Mormon. Right. So there it is. Just another permutation of what I've heard for over 40 years in the church, a limited education, a limited education. I want to make sure I pronounce that slowly. A, not unlimited education, but a very limited education. And how could he have done this? So if we're ready, can we bring Dr. Randall Bell into the studio? And let's start with the, the show. And actually, there he is. When <laughs> One quick comment just about the yeah. video real quick. Sorry, before we jump in with Randy. Um, I just, and I, sorry, I'm, I am going to be plugging Mormon stories again. But actually, Mike, who also um, is a fan of ours, uh, who has been doing the LDS discussions series on Mormon stories, his episode about the 116 pages, the last 116 pages of the Book of Mormon, really shows how bad Joseph Smith was at retaining a lot of information. And... I don't know if anyone ever thought it was kind of weird that uh, in the story of Nephi, his sisters are never named. Um, you know, no one else besides the main brothers are named. Um, and this was one of the ideas that kind of uh, was proposed by Mike that I think there's good evidence for is that because that story was already on the 116 pages, supposedly under Lehi, um, that when it was lost and Joseph Smith wasn't sure if he was going to be able to get them back or not, um, he played it safe um, in those sections that they kept writing while he was still maybe hoping that they would come back. That's where we see like the least amount of new proper names. And then once we know, like you can clearly see when What's he has material? given up or he is or it gets to the new material then he can make yeah. up all the new names he wants going on and then it just explodes out of nowhere yeah. so so he wasn't all that great actually at keeping all of these complex things in his mind and of course i think we know also that uh king benjamin or was it king mosiah um one of them ended up coming it back to it life depends. It <laughs> right depends exactly which, uh, right <laughs> yeah that's where the switch is so i just wanted to yes. point that out and then i'll drop off and uh and uh well, I think, I don't know if Randy needs a, an introduction, but we'll give him one anyway. It, it We're going to let him introduce himself. By the way, jump in anytime you want, Maven, okay? Yeah. I know you're going to be busy because there's a lot of slides in this show. So, Dr. Bell, what is it that you're a doctor of exactly anyway? Oh, uh, sociology. Well, it's socioeconomics. It's a blend of economics and sociology. Mm -hmm. And it, where yeah. is that from? Is that from some school in Los Angeles? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's an inside joke for now. You'll get it later as we go further. UCLA, right? I did grad work. I did my graduate degree at UCLA, and then I finished it uh, fielding up in Santa Barbara. Mm, that's right. I remember you showed me that place. Yeah. So you're here. You're talking tonight. Tell us a little bit about yourself and who it is you are, what you do for a living. Uh, sure. If we, maybe, if you don't mind putting the slides up, uh, this kind of helps help uh, uh, guide things. So the next slide is basically I grew up here in Southern California where I am now and I uh, checked all the boxes. I went to church every week. I went to seminary for four years, went on a mission, came back, went to BYU, taught at the MTC, uh, got married in the temple, the, the whole nine yards. So um, I, um, and the next slide kind of shows that I had kind of an interest in Mesoamerica and Aztec, Inca, and Maya civilizations. I put together, I, I look back and, you know, uh, kind of cringe, but uh, I, I put together uh, firesides on evidence for the Book of Mormon. And uh, then I earned my PhD and <laughs> kind of realized I hadn't really done my research. And I, I published some uh, quick references that were uh, distributed by Deseret Books. So I was in yeah, it to I win it. You, I, I recognize some of these uh, plastic sheets at uh, 
Deseret books. Those were yours. You made those? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah. When was that? Oh, gee. It was in the 19, I want to say 1990s. Yeah. Yeah. A long time ago. So, so you used to be an apologist, but you are no longer. Uh, no, I've kind of switched teams, but uh, yeah, I, I was an apologist, not not on the scale that you are or were RFM, but I I did my, I was the kind of guy that on the airplane, I do a lot of travel and I would have a Book of Mormon in my briefcase to hand out. Uh, I was that kind of guy. And uh, Just in case I sat down next to Mick Jagger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that happens, um, I understand. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So that's enough about me, but that's kind of my quick background. Okay. Well, I want you to let it rip because I know that you have been working so hard on this, just putting the slides together. And in the past months, you've been doing a massive amount of research, flying across the country, personally visiting places, talking to people. And I'm going to let you go ahead with that. Please start now. Okay, well, the next slide is uh, the first point I want to make, and that is to absolutely do not believe a word I say. Research what I say. This is what I tell my kids. It's what I'm going to share with everybody. I feel like I have the uh, backup and support for it, but I could be wrong. And if I'm wrong, let me know and I'll correct it. Uh, the next slide is I'm a researcher. I'm uh, the CEO of Landmark Research, and we do large-scale uh, uh, disasters around the world, and that's that's what we do here. Um and when you start a research project, you ask a research question. And the question we're going to ask tonight is, what were the original sources for what later became Mormon doctrine? And this, the genesis of this question was actually, I was driving from Park City down to Las Vegas. And I have a member in my family who knows the uh, problems with the uh, Mormon church, but he remains in the church because his position is basically... Uh, he loves the, the he loves the doctrines, and I have another member of my family who left the church. He and his wife and children all left, but he maintains the position even now that um, Joseph Smith was a mystic. And I think that, um, of course, uh, John Delan at Mormon Stories and, and you folks have done a brilliant job of kind of dismantling and showing you know the the fact that the papyrus of book of the Book of Abraham does not translate to uh, what was purported to. And, and you could go on for for uh, hours in examples of that. But that still leaves the question, at least the question I had in my mind, of where did these doctrines come? So I did what any sensible person would do, and I called up RFM. And I, I asked you that question, if you might recall. <laughs> and, and we're sitting there kind of wondering. And as we're bantering this back and forth, uh, I had a thought in the back of my head. I have no idea where it came from. I think it was something subconscious or, or in the back uh, recesses of my memory from decades ago that I heard something about Hiram Smith and Dartmouth. And I, I, I felt compelled when I, when I got to Vegas, I got on the computer and I looked it up and I found an article. So basically, maybe and if you can go to the next slide. The, the research, the, uh, there's a lot of information, and, and the way I've organized it is first phase one. That's what in research, the research professions, we call baseline, and that's point zero. Where do you start? And we're going to talk a little bit about the dominant Mormon narrative, uh, which you've kind of touched on already with the introduction. Phase two is we're going to answer where, who, and when. And a lot of these names and uh, the dates will be new to us because a lot of us think of Mormonism starting in Palmyra, New York. And it's evident that it, it, it didn't. It started before that. Um, at least so that's what I hope to, uh, to show. Phase three is going to answer the questions of what. And as I mentioned, there's so much voluminous information. I had to put it into categories so that it made some sense. And we're going to go over those. And then finally, phase four is to answer why, both from pro-Mormon and post-Mormon perspectives, because um, I've seen both perspectives of what I'm about to present. It's not widely known, the, the things that we're largely going to talk about, but that's that's kind of the uh, the map of where we're going to go. So you guys have any questions with so far? No, not at all. How about you, Bill? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Good. So uh, slide, the next slide, Maven, is 
Basically, in Mormon history, uh, we talk about church history usually in the context of Joseph Smith was born in Vermont, and he was, and then we, and he had leg surgery in Vermont, which he did, and uh, actually it was not in Vermont, it was New Hampshire, and then uh, we talk uh, about Palmyra, and then some trips to Harmony, and then there's the era of Kirtland and Missouri, two kind of two headquarters of the church. And then we talk about the Nauvoo period, and then we go to Salt Lake City, where the headquarters remains to this day. Uh, what's what's unique and what's interesting is I was again just really amazed with just how much happened in the Dartmouth era that. Uh, I, I simply didn't know about. So moving to the next slide, <clears throat> um, the dominant narrative, let's go to the next example where we're going to kind of set the baseline. What I was taught for years growing up in the, in, in the Pearl of Great Price in Joseph uh, Smith chapter one, verse three, uh, it says, I was, I'll paraphrase a little bit, but I was born in the year of the Lord of 1805 in the town of Sharon, Vermont. By the way, the ellipses are not mine. That's the way it actually reads in the Pearl of Great Price. So I, I don't know what information is missing. Um, and then we left the state of Vermont and we moved to Palmyra. That's all it says. So it, it entirely skips over the the astounding history that is actually there in uh, in and around Dartmouth University or Dartmouth College. So that's one point of view. And then the next slide <clears throat> are the Joseph Smith papers. And again, I'll paraphrase, but Joseph Smith said that uh, uh, that he grew up in a large family of nine children. And then I'll directly quote, we were deprived of the benefits of an education. And remember that quote, because it's going to come up again. So this is actually in Joseph Smith's handwriting, and that's the extent of what he talked about um, in, the, in this time frame. And then the next source, uh, the next slide, is this book, uh, Saints. And <laughs> it's a 700-page book. So I thought it, it would talk about this because on the cover, it, we know it's a standard of truth because it says here right on the cover. And uh, it had a total of three pages dedicated to this time frame, this period of time, a page and a half of it was talking about the eruption in Tambora and how it wrecked crop production around the world, which is actually, you know, true. The other page and a half, I literally copied and pasted here. And you can basically see that it talks about Tambora. It talks about the crops. It talks about Joseph Smith's uh, leg operation. And then it goes right into Joseph Smith leaving in 1817. And the, the phrase is Joseph Jr. hobbled through the snow with his mother, brothers, and sisters. And that is the entire, entire extent of what is taught by the church in a, a church published document. <clears throat> and then the next slide. Hey, Randy, is, Randy, Randy, before you go there, just uh, something that I note here on that slide. Mm -hmm. from before the cover of the book if we can get back there notice the years it's the very first book in the history of mormonism and it says 1815 to 1846 yeah. the first 10 years are not even referenced in the title you're you're absolutely right in fact there's a map in the front that doesn't even it it shows Sharon Vermont and then Potmeyer New York and Joseph Smith actually with his family lived two other places no mention of it whatsoever isn't that weird so this what I'm seeing here me, that that they go yeah. back before the church was uh, initiated like it would make sense to me if they wanted to start at 1830 but they picked 1815 and they leave off the first 10 years of their founder but they want to cover the 15 years before the church is organized yeah Exactly. Yeah, it's a strange thing. But I think what you've done is you've shown several examples of uh, current LDS church correlated materials that seems to have little to nothing to say about Joseph Smith until what? 18, well, 1815, really? That Probably 1820. Surgery. That leg surgery mm -hmm. is a big deal. And that's it. That's all they really talk about. He was born, there's leg surgery, then they moved to New York. Is that about what you find, Randy? Yeah, that's about it. Um, and, and I have one more example, uh, maybe I can show where now we're rippling out from the pub church published. This is kind of typical of what you see in kind of the uh, private sector of pro Mormon folks. And 
this is historyofmormonism.com, and you'll see that from 1805, which is actually the year Joseph Smith was born, to 1831 is labeled New York. Uh, and for, for over 10 years, uh, well, actually 12 years, Joseph Smith was not in New York out of that period. So again, you know, people can decide what that means to them. I'm going to kind of just stick with the facts, but uh, this is the dominant narrative. <clears throat> so let's get into what actually happened. And the next slide is the, the period we're going to talk about, 1805 to 1817. And the following, oh, <laughs> There was a little loud laughter in the office when this <laughs> graphic came out because we <laughs> photoshopped we photoshopped Joseph and Hiram at Dartmouth. Uh, full disclosure, Hiram is the one that went to Dartmouth, but uh, we're all honor honorary alumni of Dartmouth, at least for tonight. And then uh, the next slide, <clears throat> the next slide is uh, an article I want to, uh, one of my objectives is to really bring this article out of obscurity. I've talked to a lot of folks in doing this research, and uh, uh, John DeLynn knew about it, but uh, mo I hadn't heard of it, and most people had not. It's an article by Richard Behrens. By the way, Richard Behrens, from all accounts, was a, I, I think he's sadly passed away. I hope I'm mistaken about that. But uh, <clears throat> he was pro-Mormon. He was a TBM, true believing Mormon. And uh, so this, this the, the source that I'm largely referencing and citing tonight came from a true believing point of view. And um, as I say, I want to bring this article out of obscur obscurity. I want to give it full credit um, because a lot of this research was done by Richard Behrens, who attended Dartmouth. And so the next slide uh, shows something really important that was referenced in the Behrens article. Richard Behrens cites uh, some research done by Dr. John Smith. Dr. John Smith, I had never heard of. That's that's the next slide. And... Um, there we go. And so as a researcher, what we tend to do is we go to the original source documents when we can. And so my research team here got a hold of Dartmouth Library, of whom I, I want to thank because they were very, very helpful and very cooperative. And they actually send me sent over uh, high resolution photographs of the entirety of Dr. John Smith's theological lectures. Uh, he passed away in 1809, so I don't know where he's what the start date of this document, but I do know the end date when, when he obviously passed away. Dr. John Smith is a relative of uh, the Smith family. Um, and we're going to talk more about who he is because it's very relevant. And I then had the document transcribed, and I got it right here. And it's in a binder, and it's pretty voluminous. And I read every single word of it twice. So, uh, again, I'm summarizing <clears throat> hundreds of pages of information tonight. But <clears throat> this is where I'm getting the information. Again, don't believe what I say. Research what I say. Um, and we'll come back to Dr. Smith. So the next slide, Maven, is basically to get into the Ivy League and the geography, because if you'll remember, the first, the second phase of research, we're going to discuss who was involved, where, the geography, and when. And uh, we talked about the time frame. Let's talk about the geography. And the Ivy League consists of eight uh, universities and one college, Dartmouth College. And Dartmouth is the northernmost of all the Ivy League schools on the East Coast. It sits right on the border of Vermont and New Hampshire. Uh, like, literally, you can almost throw a rock at the uh, state line uh, that, that divides it. So, Joseph, uh, and then the next slide, Maven, <clears throat> uh, what we're going to do is zero right in on Dartmouth, which is the red dot. Because I, I think the geography is, is important here. It, it says something um, uh, that we uh, essential. So Joseph Smith was born in Sharon, Vermont. After a couple of years, they moved to a relative very close by. Um, and I'm not clear on that detail. It doesn't matter because too much because Joseph Smith would have been a toddler. And then from there, <clears throat> Joseph Smith moved to the blue dot on the bottom, which is Lebanon, New Hampshire. It's right across the river. Um, Sharon is 14 miles from Dartmouth, but using the today's road systems, when I drove it, it was about a 25-mile drive. Um, 
Lebanon, New Hampshire is much closer closer to, to Dartmouth. It's about five miles away, so it's essentially in in the neighborhood. You could you could easily walk it. And then the top blue dot. Um, later, the Smith family moved to Norwich, Vermont, back into Vermont. Again, about five miles away. So that's the local geography. Uh, started a little further away, but then moved in very close into the neighborhood of. Dartmouth College. So uh, now that we got the geography, let's take some uh, a look at some of the photos I took uh, with the next slide. This is Dartmouth Hall. It was it was built in 1784. It is really uh, I'm into architecture, and it's just a stunning building. It's just uh, I I've always been intrigued with the Ivy League, <clears throat> and um, and uh, this this is. Uh, uh, this, this is this is Dartmouth Hall. This is actually where Joseph, or excuse me, Hiram Smith lived. Uh, Hiram Smith was a student here, which is utterly shocking to me. I didn't realize that. Uh, Hiram Smith um, attended what's called Moore's Academy, which is the uh, Dartmouth Prep School. And so the Dar the Dartmouth Prep School, the medical students, and the Dartmouth College students all lived in this hall. Uh, that was constructed before Joseph Smith or Hiram Smith were built. And then if you look to my we're born left, even. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I think I misspoke there. So if you look to my left behind me, kind of kitty corner, if you can go to the next slide, uh, Maven, this is the Dartmouth Church. It's, today it's called the Old White Chapel. That's kind of the uh, nickname, at least my recollection of it, because I spoke to some uh, doctors there. And uh, it was born. It was built in 1771. And as a student of Dartmouth, Hiram Smith would have been a, required to attend both morning and evening, uh, kind of think of Mormon uh, seminary, kind of theological lessons morning and night. So Hiram Smith attended Dartmouth for four years. That would have been well over 1,000 uh, lectures he would have gotten uh, received in this chapel. And John Smith, which I mentioned earlier, was actually the pastor, and he is a Smith family relative. He passed away when Joseph Smith was about four years old, and Hiram was about nine, but he was the, the pastor at this chapel uh, uh, at the time he passed away. So the next uh, slide <clears throat> is... Dartmouth Medical School, and this is going to become important as we talk about Joseph Smith's leg surgery, because it wasn't just any surgeon that uh, that operated on him. It was a a, um, a a surgeon from Dartmouth Medical School, and we'll get into that in a minute. And then the next slide, we're going to, now we've kind of covered the red dot. Now we're going to go to the various blue dots where the Smith family lived. Now, this photo is uh, familiar, at least to me, because I took two family vacations there to show the kids where Joseph Smith was born. This is the Joseph Smith birthplace. Again, he was born in 1805 and lived there until 1811. And then the next slide shows the actual footprint of the cabin where Joseph Smith was born. The rock in the middle was the, the fireplace hearth. And uh, so Joseph Smith, after he was born, was laid on that hearth. At least I was told that by the visitor center folks there. And then uh, in 18, uh, your logo's covering it, but uh, 1811 is the date. Yeah, the Smith family moved to the next slide, and today it is a Kentucky Fried Chicken. But this is the actual home site where Joseph Smith lived when he had his uh, leg surgery. And Joseph Smith, no doubt, had a very serious leg issue, and the standard remedy in those days was amputation. The Dartmouth, and, and by the way, Joseph Smith didn't have a leg surgery. He had two. The first one was a failure. And the second one performed by Dr. Nathan Smith out of Harvard, or excuse me, out of Dartmouth, uh, was a success. And as I say, it was on the home on the site. And at this point, we're about five, again, five miles from Dartmouth campus. Um, he had numerous, at least 18 visits from Dartmouth um, medical doctors. Two of them were Smith family relatives. So um, there's, we're starting to get the layering here that not only was the Smith family nearby Dartmouth, Hiram was attending Dartmouth, and there were cousins and uncles and aunts and, and extended relatives 
all in the in the area we're talking about. And, and Dr. John Smith, he was not only a founder of Dartmouth, he was also, if I remember correctly, a first cousin to Joseph Smith Sr. Is that correct? That, that's right. And whatever that relationship was, it was close enough to assist uh, Hiram Smith getting into Dartmouth. Um, I will tell you that, of course, we hear the story about Joseph Smith's leg surgery. We usually only hear one one surgery. But it's like the surgeons and the stories that I hear in church, they show up on the doorstep like the wise men with the gifts for Jesus. It's like, where did these guys come from? You know? Yeah. Yeah. But now you're telling us. Very, very different. There were multiple trips uh, with the Dartmouth doctors. Joseph Smith's uh, leg problem was very perplexing. And they were kind of pioneering new technology. Dr. Nathan Smith was at least 10 years ahead of his time. Right. And when you're a doctor, frankly, and a surgeon who's doing cutting edge stuff, you're looking for people who have these problems so you can test out your new methods. Uh, Yes, that's true. And Dr. Nathan Smith, by the way, Dr. Smith was not a relative. He has the same last name, but he was the he wasn't just any Dartmouth doctor. I mean, just being a Dartmouth doctor is is uh, noteworthy. But he was the founder of Dartmouth Medical School. He, he was a big deal. And, and by the way, Dr. Nathan Smith and Dr. John Smith, who is, is a relative of the Smith family to this day, is a big deal uh, as far as being founding fathers of Dartmouth College. Well, it okay. is interesting that, that uh, there are these connections and that there is a reason that these doctors even heard about this in the first place to show up to do these operations. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, and then the next the next slide, Maven, is um, the house that the family, the Smith family, lived in Norwich, Vermont. Again, five about five miles from from the campus. By even today's standards, it's a very nice house. And this is where the Smith family lived after the leg surgery from about eighteen fourteen to eighteen seventeen. So. Um, that's kind of a quick overview of the geography. Um, the next place we want to go is the next slide, which are the Dartmouth connections. And of course, uh, well, there's six uh, people here, Hiram Smith and Joseph Smith, of course, we've we've heard of, at least I, I think we've all heard of. Um, but the other four people we have not. And they're and by the way, there are several other connections. I'm not. I'm. I'm kind of simplifying. Uh, if anything, I, I'm certainly not overstating the case. Um, John Wheelock was. He'll become more relevant when, when I show you the timeline. But John Wheelock was the president of Dartmouth University. John Wheelock would have interviewed Hiram Smith when he entered um, Dartmouth. And John Wheelock. In fact, I'm starting to collect rare documents on this topic. And here's a a rare uh, original document that uh, is Dr. uh, uh, Dr. Smith was eulogized when he passed away by John Wheelock and his his uh, admiration and love uh, for him was so intense that it was actually published as a pamphlet. Uh, John Wheelock and Dr. John Smith developed the curriculum for Dartmouth. And Dr. John Smith was Dartmouth's very first professor. And I'm going to talk more about John, Dr. John Smith more, but keep in mind, he is, again, a, a relative of the Smith family. Um, another name that I was very surprised to see um, was Ethan Smith. Ethan Smith, of course, I knew because I had listened to your episode about View of the Hebrews. He's the author of a view of the Hebrews. I knew that, but I didn't know he attended Dartmouth, and I certainly didn't know that his son attended Dartmouth and was a contemporary with Hiram Smith. So, um, very interesting connections from some very interesting people. And then I've already mentioned Dr. Nathan Smith. He is again the surgeon that performed the surgery, the leg surgery on Joseph Smith, and was the uh, founder of Dartmouth Medical School. Right. And the asterisks you have on this slide, they designate people with the last name Smith who are not related to the Joseph Smith family, correct? Absolutely. And throughout the whole uh, the whole uh, episode, I always put an asterisk by the Smiths that are not related. By the way, Randy, I just figured out who Tad Collister reminds me of. Ethan Who's Smith. <laughs> okay. It's either I that know. or Mark Hamill after the car wreck. 
Six months of research and I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next slide. <laughs> um, the, the, the next kind of moving component or piece of the puzzle is, and, and I, I certainly knew this, but I just it, it's important everybody's on the same page, that um, Joseph and Hiram are very, very close to each other. And the first quote I have from Lucy Max Smith, um, and uh, uh, this is a book that Brigham Young wanted banned, uh, but for a lot of reasons, <laughs> but, but, uh, he, he, I'll just quote part of it. She says the Hiram was uh, rather remarkable for his tenderness and sympathy and now desire that he might take, uh, my place. And he laid with Joseph on the bed and, uh, beside him almost day and night as Joseph Smith as is suffering through this agonizing leg surgery, uh, or, or leg, leg, uh, the, the leg problems. And then later the surgery, and then from the Barron's article again, and I would really encourage people to, to get that article. It's online uh, and read it. But um, he says Hiram would remain home for a year to attend homebound Joseph, who remained on crutches for the next four years to be tutored by Hiram. And it's important to remember that Hiram Smith, his profession was a school teacher. And so... Uh, and he served on, like he was in the, the school boards and he was like the... Uh, something to do with the education that was head over the schools at some point too. Like he was heavily involved in the education system and where the area where he lived. You're absolutely right, Bill. Uh, later on in Palmyra, he was a school teacher uh, uh, and involved the school board. board and education, it, yeah. 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 And he wasn't, he wasn't, uh, that's no surprise. I mean, he, he had, while most people went to public school or at the, in those days called common school, uh, the, uh, he, had an Ivy League background, so he had an impressive educational background. Mm. Okay, right. yeah. So the next slide is some of the um, is about uh, Dr. John Smith, and I want to fill in some gaps because he's really a remarkable person. I think uh, Sander Tanner would love him as because he was a, a very devout Christian. He was also a theologian. Um, and uh, I, I admire him uh, uh, quite a bit and really enjoyed reading his essays. They were kind of thick. Uh, I can't think of a better word to read through, but they were they were really uh, fascinating. But anyway, he was, as I mentioned, he was Dartmouth's first professor. He was a master of ancient languages, theology, philosophy, and uh, science of Newton. And, and the thing is, is that back in those days, theology was very holistic. You didn't just study theology, you studied theology in conjunction with philosophy and science. Uh, he was a board trustee of Dartmouth. As I mentioned, he was the pastor of the White Chapel. He was the Dartmouth College bookstore proprietor. He was the college librarian. He developed the curriculum with John Wheelock. Uh, he was conversant and taught. Now, this is this is crazy. This is giving you some competition, RFM. He was conversant in Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Chaldaic, Syriac, Assyriac, Arabic, and Coptic or Coptic. So he, he, I have trouble with English, but this he, he was really a bright intellectual. He was also, and this will come up later, he was the chaplain of Hanover Masonic Lodge, which was established before Joseph Smith was born in 1796. Um his theological lectures that I showed earlier that I had transcribed were his magnum opus, his uh, opus, his uh, masterpiece. And he died, sadly, before his lectures could be published. So this material was there, but it never got published. And that's why we're a lot of us, certainly I am hearing about it for the very first time. Uh, very highly respected intellectual. And as we already covered, he was... Uh, a relative, we'll just say that, but to get, for those genealogists listening, he was Joseph Smith Sr.'s parents' first cousin. Um, <clears throat> okay. Can I just say something? This is remarkable. All these things that Dr. John Smith did, it's quite impressive. And I'm just struck by the fact that if this were about Joseph Smith, and if this were general conference, it would be followed up with the conclusion that nobody could have ever done all these things on their own unless they were somehow divinely guided. Yeah, well, well said. Um, and and while you're uh, while you're talking, Maven, if you can show the next slide, and I actually got this idea from URFM, and I think you might be better uh, positioned to explain explain your point on this one. 
Oh, if we could just go back to the last slide for a second. Yeah, I was looking at these slides. I think it was this past weekend when we were talking about it on Zoom or whatever it was we were sharing slides on. And it was this one down here where it talks about Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Chaldaic, Syriac, Assyriac, Arabic, and Coptic. And I said, well, that sounds a lot like the languages that, according to Martin Harris, Charles Anton identified as being the characters on the, the script, the manuscript page that Martin Harris took to New York. And so you've got Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Chaldaic, Syriac, Assyriac, Arabic, and Coptic. And then we go to the next slide, which shows... The next slide, which there we go. Um, this is that whole story, right? It's in the Pearl of Great Price. It's in your your scriptures. I then showed him. This is supposed to be Martin Harris. Of course, it's Joseph Smith representing what Martin Harris uh, allegedly told him. But then I then showed him. I, Martin Harris, then showed him Charles Anton. Those characters, which were not yet translated. And he said that they were Egyptian, Chaldaic, Assyriac, and Arabic. And he said they were true characters. Now, it's strange, first of all, that this is in the official version of the church history as to what happened. And yet, it seems strange that in a book that is supposed to be written in Reformed Egyptian, that according to Charles Anton, at least, in the official version, he identifies the characters as Egyptian, Chaldaic, Assyriac, and Arabic, which actually have no business being on these plates whatsoever and if this is correct that this is what charles anton said and the fact that it doesn't fit into the narrative makes me think maybe it is correct that that's what he said one wonders where joseph smith would have found such characters in those languages to copy down on this piece of paper and then be identified by charles anton when we have a person in the neighborhood who's related to the family who apparently is quite conversant in those languages as well as others. Yeah, beautifully said. And I, I didn't make that connection. You did. And I thought it was, it, you're absolutely right. What are those languages even being discussed? Because the Book of Mormon, the, the gold plates were presumably Reformed Egyptian. These other languages are irrelevant to that at, in its entirety. So it's, it's an amazing uh, connection. Um, all right, so the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit more about Hiram Smith. And, um, you know, my opinion now, I, I'm going to keep my conjecture to the a minimum, but I do have the opinion that the real intellectual giant behind Mormonism is actually Hiram Smith. And I'll tell you why I think that. And I could be wrong, but that's that's what I, I tend to believe, is that at, at, in this time frame, only one in 1,500 people uh, and the entire population made it into col college. Um, so Hiram Smith is in a very elite uh, group. And this comes, by the way, from the book uh, Secret Combinations by Kathleen Kimball uh, Melanakos. Did I say that right, RFM? I think it's yeah. Melanakos. Melanakos, thank you. Uh, but anyway, she, I want to thank her because she was very helpful in, in uh, my research. But um, she wrote this in her book, um, and that... To get into Dartmouth, um, it meant you had to translate languages, uh, Latin and Greek and, and so forth. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a place for, uh, uh, you know, kind of public educated folks like me. It was, it was really the intellectual elite. So uh, Hiram Smith was a big deal. And as I said, he attended over 1,000 theological lectures at Jar Dartmouth Church, um, and also lived and was housed and educated in Dartmouth Hall itself. All all of this was brand new to me, uh, and and it it gets even better. So the next slide is I noticed when I got to Dartmouth that um, uh, by the way the first picture is a picture of a chapel between the Norwich house that the Smith family lived in Dartmouth campus. And the second picture is a cropped picture of Dartmouth Hall. And in the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph Smith received revelations on the architecture for Kirtland Temple, and then later uh, the Nauvoo Temple. I thought that it was interesting that those revelations were not, not identical by a long shot, but certainly simi similar to the federal architecture uh, there in the Dartmouth, in and around Dartmouth. 
and we're going to see this theme growing throughout as, as we talk about this, because this is one of literally dozens and dozens of connections of, of themes and concepts that are in and around Dartmouth that later show up as Mormon doctrine. And in saying that, I want to be very clear and very explicit. I am not making any claim of exclusivity. I'm not saying that Joseph Smith only got these ideas in and around Dartmouth. He clearly got them from a variety of places and got more concepts and themes later. But as we see in going back to the original research question, um, <clears throat> In terms of where was the genesis, where was the beginning of these, uh, what were distinct Mormon doctrines, uh, it's clearly uh, Dartmouth has uh, something significant uh, about that that question. So the next slide, oh, sorry, go ahead. That's okay. Randy, I just want to throw in here that this is so fascinating to me. And as you were talking about this and Hiram Smith and his going to Dartmouth for four years total, although apparently he took some time off to take care of Joseph after his leg surgery. But um, the thing that's so interesting to me about Hiram is that we know so little about Hiram. When I think about what I learn in church about Hiram, I know that he's Joseph Smith's big brother. I know that they are very, very close. I know that Hiram Smith asked Joseph Smith to, you know, talk about how it was he translated the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith begged off on it. I know that Hiram Smith um, was a hard sell on polygamy, but eventually came around to it. I know that he was obviously killed with Joseph Smith in 1844 and that he read from the Book of Mormon, this very book, and turned down the page there in the Book of Ether. But you know something? For a guy who is so tight with Joseph, and John Taylor writes in section 135, in life they were not divided, in death they were not separated, and they even have that... Um, uh, that statute that you showed earlier where Hiram is right there with Joseph standing right behind him. These two, I think, were closer than anybody else in that entire family. And yet, what else do we know about him? He seems to be a shadowy figure in Mormon history, in spite of the fact that he seems to be very important in Joseph Smith's life. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I, I, the way I would... Uh put it, is that Joseph or Joseph was the charismatic public face of Mormonism, and Hiram was very obviously content being quiet, the quiet intellectual in the background. And we know, I, I mean, uh, I have an intellectual in my family, a true intele gifted intellectual, and he's very quiet uh, and painfully quiet about, um, you know, absolutely zero interest in Facebook or Facebook posts or anything else. And, and that's how some intellectuals are. And that's how I kind of imagined Hiram Smith was. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Maven, the next slide is basically my effort uh, to put a graphic together to bring it all together, both the, the geography and some of the key people. And uh, that we've uh, kind of summarizes. And then the final, uh, the next graphic, Maven, is a timeline. And this is really, I had to kind of lay the uh, groundwork or none of this would make uh, a lot of sense. But now that we've had this, this background, um, I think it will. And this is the Dartmouth timeline and for the Dartmouth period from 1805, again, where Joseph Smith was born to 1817, where Joseph Smith left, uh, left uh, Vermont. And we've already talked about Sharon, Vermont, and then Lebanon, New Hampshire, and Norwich. And I have little photographs of those three places. And then after 1817, we're off to Palmyra, and that's a whole different uh, topic. And then so with this timeline, uh, some of the key players, I just want to kind of show where they fit into the timeline. And then keep your eye on the gray bar that shows the time frame where Hiram Smith was in Dartmouth. And notice the convergence and the overlap. And in other words, the very intense download of, of advanced intellectual information during that time frame. So Joseph Smith um, and, uh, had his leg surgery in 1813, and then his recovery continued after he left um, the Dartmouth area. 
And so we see that. And again, his relatives, two of the doctors on the surgical team were relatives. And Dr. Nathan Smith was the founder of Dartmouth Medical School, actually performed the successful surgery. Then we have Dr. Nathan Smith, his involvement and numerous follow-ups were in that 1813 to 1817 timeframe. Um, and Hiram Smith uh, was born in 1800, but his Dartmouth period was commenced in 1811 and ended in 1816. In your right RFM, there was a sabbatical there because he got typhoid fever and uh, and so forth. Then it's also uh, noteworthy that the Masonic Lodge was was constructed in Hanover, uh, in the same town that Dartmouth is in, uh, and Dr. John Smith was the chaplain of. Uh, the Masonic Lodge, and then he died in 1809, but his sons attended Dartmouth and were contemporaries with Hiram Smith. And, um, and we're gonna, uh, we're, as far as where we're about to go, we're about to get into the content of Dr. Smith's theological lectures and the conversations that were around it. And interestingly enough, dozens upon dozens of them end up later as Mormon doctrine. Uh, Ethan Smith, again, the author of View of the Hebrews, his son, Lyndon Smith, attended Dartmouth. He um, graduated from Dartmouth, and he um, was a contemporary with Hiram Smith. So remember Dartmouth Hall, These all these folks are living in Dartmouth Hall and going to school and going to the morning and evening church services together. And this, this was, uh, I haven't even mentioned this yet, uh, again, very surprising. Uh, Solomon Spalding was a graduate of Dartmouth. He graduated in 1785. And by the way, Ethan Smith graduated in 1790. Now, most of us know the story uh, that went, the, essentially the Book of Mormon is copied from uh, the Solomon Spalding manuscript. And in talking to Dan Vogel, talking to Sandra Smith, uh, and, and along with my own primary research, I, I, I agree with them. I don't think that the Spalding manuscript was uh, the source of uh, how where the Book of Mormon came from. But there's certainly themes of it we're going to talk about later that are interesting parallels. What's interesting is, that is Levi Spalding was a second cousin of uh, his uncle uh, Solomon Spalding. He was also a contemporary with um, uh, Hiram Smith. And then finally, uh, I'm sorry, the way the graphics are going... Um, it, it covered up the last one. Sorry. Uh, John Wheelock was kind of the central hub of all of this. He knew all these people. He was best friends from all kind of BFFs with Dr. John Smith. He interviewed Hiram. And then when he entered Dartmouth and would have inter interviewed him intermittently along with all the other students and, and checked in with them face to face from time to time. So he's certainly a hub between uh, not just Hiram, but Hiram and all these other folks. So, and, and by the way, um, uh, Kathleen M M Melanica, I'm sorry. Uh, how do, Mel Melanakis, I think. Mel yeah, Melanakis. It's she, all great uh, to me. Yeah, I, and by the way, I, I love her book. She, it's a really wild ride. <laughs> it's a, That's a different topic. But uh, uh, she points out the schools, the, the class sizes were very small. Uh, it wasn't like going, I went to Troy High School with uh, 4,000 students. It wasn't anything like that. It was like 30, 35, 40 students. It, it varied, but they were small, intimate groups uh, that you're sharing the fount uh, drinking fountain with in, in the, the small uh, elite Dartmouth environment. So we're about to break into the next phase. Any, any thoughts or comments before we do? Just are you saying 30 to 35 students in a class? Yeah, like the class of uh, 1805, that, that, the graduate the entire year. course. Yeah, the entire graduate yeah. Oh, course. the entire year, not just in a classroom for a particular subject. Right, right. Yeah. I'm surprised at how many people and relatives of famous people that I've heard of were rubbing shoulders together. Exactly. And who, and who knew? I certainly didn't know. Um, through going to BYU and taking all the religion classes that I did, I, I never heard any of this. Um, okay, so what I've the, the next phase that we're getting into is, and, and the graphic I put together is basically the Dartmouth period, 
in and around Dartmouth, and then the themes of Mormonism. And because, again, there's so much information, I put it into five categories, and we're going to talk about them one at a time. And people can draw their own conclusions. And then, uh, and again, this information primarily comes from uh, the jo Dr. John Smith's theological lectures, and the recipient most certainly would have been Hiram Smith at Dartmouth uh, Hall. Clearly, Hiram Smith learned a lot uh, of other things um, aside from Dr. Smith's um, theological lectures, but but this was a, a like I say a tremendous download of advanced intellectual information. So the next slide is to talk about ancient American myth, uh, mythology. Uh, Maybe in the next slide, there we go. And um, this is, uh, Dan Vogel's written about this and done just a, a really meticulously great job at, at detailing a lot of the things, particularly in the Ohio area uh, uh, and so forth. But what we're talking about is backing up to New Hampshire and Vermont. And we hear about the earthworks, and earthworks are uh, the um, uh, um, Indian mound mythology. And let me just say, <clears throat> Indian mounds are not a myth. They are physically there. The mythology is over who constructed them. We don't know, and to this day we don't know. I, I certainly don't know. But the thing that's really distinct about Vermont and uh, New Hampshire are the stoneworks. And... Uh, Dan Vogel mentions the stoneworks in Ohio, but so far, and I don't pretend I've read everything, and, and by the way, another disclaimer, I'm not a historian, but I have not seen mention of stoneworks in and around Vermont and New Hampshire. We're going to take some pictures of them, of them because they're, they're very impressive. There was certainly a local mythology, and still is to this day, in terms of who built them. We see everything from the uh, Native Americans in those days called the Indians built them, to uh, the colonial uh, settlers built them, which is tough to, to grasp, uh, to the Vikings built them and Nordic people. And, and there's all kinds of mythology in terms of who constructed them. And as I say, that still exists today. There's also the characteristic of uh, archaeoastronomy, which is the blend of architectural uh, 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 construction and astronomy, in other words, alignments with the winter solstice, uh, summer solstice, and these kind of things. There were lots of stories about the ten, lost ten tribes, tribes of Israel. I mean, that's what Ethan Smith was largely about. Uh, there was, uh, again, we mentioned Solomon Spalding, uh, Ethan and his son Lyndon Smith, and View of the Hebrews, rumors of mystical thinking, rumors of hidden treasure. Uh, I don't believe, I, I haven't seen evidence yet that Joseph Smith started any treasure digging in this time frame. He's 12 years old when he, or, or thereabouts when he left the area. But certainly all these concepts and themes were in the air. So the next slide is actually, this is an area, ancient American mythology is an area that I bring a little bit of expertise to the table. I had a case in federal court, and this was a courtroom exhibit where I literally went coast to coast and study what I'm about to talk about. So while the other topics, I don't claim a particular expertise, this one I do a little bit. So the next slide is just to see a picture of what an Indian mound looks like. Um, Bill, you probably remember these from your days in Ohio, but pretty common, um, very, very common. In fact, there's been estimates that they're in the millions. Um, they A lot of them have been plowed over uh, through farming or commercial development or residential Potential development, but that's what a mound looks like. Sometimes they contain bones, sometimes they don't. But what's really unique to the Dartmouth, the proximity around Dartmouth is the next slide, and those are the stoneworks. And like I say, I haven't seen this mentioned in the context of New Hampshire and Vermont when it relates to uh, Mormon history. Um, these stoneworks are megalithic stones. They're very heavy, and uh, they, uh, they don't seem to serve a, a practical purpose, which even adds to their mystique. And the next slide is another Stoneworks. It's, um, uh, 
some of them are big enough you can actually walk into. And the next slide, they get smaller and bigger. This one is tiny. There's rumors that the colonists put these together to, as for uh, vegetable storage of vegetable sellers. That doesn't make a lot of sense because uh, there's easy ways to construct them. Um, and there's also, um, uh, they, they don't oftentimes have a lot of volume to you know hold a lot of vegetables. I have no opinion on who constructed them or why. I'm just giving some of the arguments I've heard on the topic. The next slide, Maven, is some of them, as I say, are very large. Some of them have sophisticated hidden chambers in them. And the next slide is the other end of the spectrum where it just is overbuilt. It makes no logical sense. And the it goes back just a few feet not really practical for any kind of um, any kind of uh, 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 shelter from the elements or as a, a place to call home. The next slide is uh, moving off the chambers. And by the way, there are literally uh, thousands of these in the region of Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, this is called a serpentine wall. And this is a wall that um, in Ohio, you, uh, they have Serpent Mound, which is an earth mound. But in uh, New Hampshire and Vermont, they have uh, they, these walls kind of go back and forth in the kind of snake fashion for 25, 50 yards. And notice the end stone is in the shape of a, of a um, serpent's head. So imagine Joseph and Hiram and every other schoolboy or schoolgirl back in those days at that age, running around the woods and coming across these things with a frequency of coming across a fire hydrant. I mean, they're very common uh, in today's context. Um, and, you know, the mystery of, of who built them. The next slide is uh, these walls. And these walls are generally, genuinely baffling. They don't they don't enclose anything. So they're not used to contain livestock. They don't, they're not used as a fortress because people can easily just hop over them. And they're, um, they're not used for agriculture because these areas were not known to ever have agriculture in terms of stones, uh, stacking stones to, to clear a field. Um, the next slide is some more. This is the archaeoastronomy. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I skipped. Uh, this is called a window. And these are kind of like small. These are smaller stones, even though they're still megalithic. Uh, but they're kind of um, a, a window. I've heard the word hobbits, you know, <laughs> used. I, I, I have no opinion on that. The next slide is. Um, so you're saying it could be hobbits who built it. I could be. Uh, it's as we say in court RFM, it's anything is possible, <laughs> but pro not probable. <laughs> so. Uh, so, so, so here's um, these walls, and according to one professor from Uni University of Connecticut, there's 240,000 miles of these, and nobody knows who really built them. That's a lot of miles of stone walls that have no practical, no apparent practical uh, value. The next exhibit or next slide is uh, the archaeoastronomy. Uh, this is the uh, stones that point at, uh, I have a friend that actually owns this site. It's in his backyard. And when the sun is setting on summer solstice, he'll send me a picture of the sun setting over this stone. So they, whoever built them had some uh, obvious advanced knowledge. Um, and the final stone that uh, the next exhibit is what's called a dolmen. These are large me megalithic stones on three legs. Sometimes the legs are stacked like this one. Sometimes they're just one big rock. Was it whether this was used to dress game like deer or whatever game animals were uh, were uh, uh, caught or human sacrifice or pressing grapes? I have no idea what this was used, but it obviously has uh, ruts carved into it for drainage of some kind. So again, fueling enormous speculation as where they came from. And some people feel that the stoneworks are far more impressive because of the megalithic stones involved than the uh, mounds. I think they're all impressive, but that's one point of view. The next slide is just to kind of show that there are associations and websites that talk about this. There are books. The next slide are two books that I really enjoy. Um, yeah, the next, the next one, Megan, uh, Maven. Yeah, there we go. 
uh, the first book here, the gentleman, uh, Markham Starr, as I said, has documented 8,000 of these. Uh, the middle book is the professor in the University of Connecticut I mentioned, Robert Thorson. And then I really like Dan Vogel's book, uh, Indian Origins and the Book of Mormon. He talks a lot about this, but it's more, again, moving over, over to Ohio where it takes a different um, – <clears throat> It looks a little different, but it's still on that grand scale of uh, mythology. So the next slide, um, this is bringing this theme of ancient America mythology back to Dartmouth, is view of the Hebrews. And from uh, Kathleen's book, Secret Combinations, I, I, I think, uh, I, again, I think uh, uh, Dan Vogel and Sander Tanner are correct, but I think Kathleen makes a really valid point that uh, – the Solomon Spalding manuscript talks about a, a lost story in a stone box, translations into English, an account of a portion of the North American population, wars to extermination between two factions, and impossible levels of slaughter like we read about around the Hill Cumorah. So there are some similarities. That, and again, Solomon Spalding was a graduate of Dartmouth. So there's something really unique and special about Dartmouth that we're going to get to. And then the next slide is view of the Hebrews. And I actually got this from, I think I got it from Sandra Tanner's website. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, Ethan Smith, class Dartmouth class of 1790, his son, Lyndon Smith, class of Dartmouth class of 1817. It's dealing with the origins of the American Indians and mound builders settled in the new world and were the lost 10 tribes of Israel and the Indian legend of a lost book of God, which would one day be returned. And I mean, you've read it, RFM. I've tried to read it and I, I couldn't do it. But do you have anything to add there? No, just that once again, it's very impressive that all these people are getting together. It's almost like a melting pot of information that Hiram Smith is getting this high level of exposure to. And then, I mean, how often does he go home? It's only five miles away. He probably goes there every weekend. And I'm thinking, trying to put myself in that position, are we to assume that Hiram Smith doesn't have textbooks that he's studying from? Is he taking those home with him? Is he taking notes? Is he taking those home with him? And what on earth are he and Joseph talking about during the long days and years that Joseph Smith is recuperating from this leg surgery? Yeah, exactly. Um, so the next slide, we're going to change Sorry, gear. I, oh, go I ahead, wanted Maven. to jump in real um, if uh, anyone wants to know more about what RFM thinks of view of the Hebrews, that's also a Mormon stories episode, right? RFM, I think you collaborated with somebody about, about reading this book, right? Well, the important thing to know is that whatever podcast that was on, I put it up at radiofreemormon.org where I encourage radiofreemormon.org. <laughs> <laughs> you can learn more yeah, it, about this on RFM's podcast. It was, it was at Mormon stories and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are you saying something, Bill? I just said it's number 216 at RadioFreeMormon.org. I'm going to put it you in, are the, a font uh, in the font of information. Now. It's like you have my entire uh, canon memorized. Anytime somebody mentions where something is, I try to go searching for it so I can put it in the link so the viewers can follow up. You are the best. Nice. Okay, so we've talked about ancient America. I've already mentioned uh, several themes that later showed up in Mormon doctrine. Now we're going to move to Christianity. And this one is uh, triple voluminous because, after all, Dartmouth uh, College and Dartmouth uh, Chapel were, were theological, uh, <laughs> were all about Christian theology. Um, here, Hiram Smith would have been downloaded enormous amounts of information on the Bible and the Apocrypha. By the way, I, um, um, Steve Pinecker mentioned that the Bible that uh, is very, very similar to Third Nephi is a 1769 uh, issue, and, and uh, Steve and I are probably going to talk about that uh, later on another podcast. But um, I, I never heard of the Apocrypha after four years of seminary when I'm a, on a mission until I came across it on my mission in England, what the Apocrypha even is. And in reading it, 
if I if my memory is right, it talks about Nephi and other names that sounded awfully familiar. Um, the the by the way, the the second bullet point is really kind of um, stood out to me because the name of the church at Dartmouth was the Church of Christ, which is also shows up later as the first name of the Mormon church, the for, first formal name, the Church of Christ. Now, Sander Tanner is right that it could have also come from the Campbellites, or it could have come from any other, uh, a number of other places, I suppose. But it's interesting that Hiram Smith attended over 1,000 1, theological lectures uh, at Dartmouth, and that the name of the church, uh, the first Mormon church, was the Church of Christ. Um uh, I think it was uh, Solomon Spalding's uh, cousin, or the uh, he had a first vision experience, as did others. So people were having these experiences uh, in and around Dartmouth that uh, are very similar to first vision experiences. Um, Dr. John Smith was a legitimate translator, and it's just interesting that Joseph Smith later claimed to be a prophet, seer, uh, uh, what is it, prophet, seer, and revelator, and translator. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, the uh, Dartmouth College had a school of the prophets. I always thought the school of the prophets is something revealed to, to Joseph Smith in Nauvoo or something like that, uh, or in uh, in uh, Kirtland. Uh, it turns out this the Dartmouth College had a school for the prophets. But by the way, this is interesting. The term prophet had a different meaning. It meant professor of theology. So a prophet wasn't somebody that came and had revelations and uh, these kinds of experiences. A prophet was somebody who knew um, Christian theology by reading its original text, whether it be in Hebrew or Greek or, or whatever those texts are. So that was a prophet, a revelation or theological lessons. So instead of going to the college uh, and having a professor, if you're in theological school, you would your uh, teacher would be called a prophet, and then those lessons would be called revelations. Uh, so that terminology came up uh, there at Dartmouth. The mission of the of of Dartmouth uh, was to take the gospel to the Indians. Again, uh, a theme that uh, shows up later is Mormon doctrine. And in his lectures, he talks specifically about Aaron and Melchizedek. Um, and again, there's voluminous information, but that kind of summarizes it. The, the, next, uh, the next photo, uh, Maven, is the actual going back to the church, and we, which we've seen that picture. But the next picture is I'm getting closer and actually taking a picture of the name of the church, the Church of Christ, established in 1771. And then if uh, we go to the next picture, we see that I'm going inside the chapel. And as I, I was all by myself when I was there, and I just, you know, had a, a moment to kind of realize this is where Dr. John Smith presented his theological lectures for over 35 years. And this is where Hiram Smith attended for uh, four years. So really has some historical significance to to Mormonism. Um, then the next slide is the an absolute truth claim, which I, I thought was kind of interesting as I kind of tried to put things together. And I'm quoting from Joseph Smith history in the Pearl of Great Price, chapter one, verses 18 and 19. And I'm not going to quote the whole thing, but I'm going to go right to this language where Joseph Smith is quoting God, meaning Mormon God, uh, and talking about uh, other theologians and stating that they were all wrong, that they were all, all their creeds were an abomination, and all their professors were all corrupt. Their Mormon God is using the word all three times. You can't get more absolute than that. And uh, as we're about to see, keep this in mind as we take a look at what was being taught in Dartmouth, uh, more about Christianity, that these were all wrong, all corrupt, all an abomination, and yet they show up later as Mormon doctrine. And that's, uh, I think that would be a concern for a pro-Mormon position. Um, the next slide is an attempt to take, again, lots of information, talk briefly about some of these theologians and what they said. Of course, there was uh, an argument between uh, the Jacobs, uh, Jacobus Arminius position and the Calvinist John Calvin positions, 
and then a lot of other subset uh, I don't want to say arguments or debates, discussions, whatever you want to call them. Uh, Adam Clark is a name that I didn't know until recently when it came out at BYU about the Adam Clark Bible commentary. And by the way, you can buy those books, and I have off Amazon. Adam Clark to this day is cons- uh, uh, revered as a, a, as a uh, uh, respected Christian theologian. Um, and uh, there are uh, literally hundreds of his comments within the Bible commentary, the Adam Clark Bible commentary, showed up later in the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. And it, it's even more than that. Was uh, As I'm going through things, Adam Clark uh, had a, a booklet or a book, or a chapter of a book, I'm not sure which, uh, talking about tobacco use, which correlates to Christian use of um, tobacco which is a, a, a concept, uh, a concept. Um, then we got Thomas Campbell and his son, Alexander Cam- Campbell. The whole restoration movement was a big thing in those days, To the idea to restore Christ's original New Testament church. And they were another source of the uh, name Church of Christ, which was Mormonism's first formal name. Jonathan Edwards was probably the biggest... Um, theologian name in the time. He wrote a very famous uh, uh, lecture called uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And there's actually a book uh, written by a pro-Mormon about Book of Mormon phraseology showing up in the Book of Mormon Um, and a discussion about Zion in the latter days. And then the last person here... Just really quick, just really quick. I just want to throw this up there. Yes, Adam Clark's... uh... A dissertation on the use of an abuse of tobacco. So just FYI. So there anyway. you go. Yeah. Don't believe what I say. Up. Research what I say. Thank you. And then uh, let's talk about Ethan Swedenborg. And Maven, I'd really to love to invite you to this conversation. But the next slide is um, uh, fascinating. Uh, Maven, can you kind of reiterate your your background with, with all of this with Ethan Swedenborg and your mission? <laughs> yes. Are you having some um, kind of earthquake there, Maven? Yeah. No, sorry. I can. I'm just trying to get my bed up a little bit higher <laughs> to match the. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I think I mentioned this. Um, I, I've mentioned it a couple times before, but yeah, this is the Church of the New Jerusalem, and um, in between, like doing the slides, I was trying to see if I could find a picture of me there from my mission, but I just have like hard copies. I didn't quite get around to digitizing them. But yeah, this was. Um, it's a it's an amazing building. They do tours all the time. I was there several times on P days as an activity, and they have a little stand that had a, a lot of pamphlets about Emanuel Swedenborg and uh, a lot of his doctrines. And I had taken, I I remember too that had LDS doctrines in them uh, that troubled me. And so at the time, I thought, well. Um, I think my first reaction was I wanted to, uh, I wanted to think that Swedenborg came after Joseph Smith, obviously. Um, and then I think once I realized that that was not the case, um, you know, I, the way I rationalized why these things could be here, why Emmanuel Swedenborg could have these thoughts, I was thinking, um, you know, the Lord can reveal things to like whoever he wants to. Um, and it was just Joseph's job to bring this all to the forefront to restore the restoration. But that doesn't mean that if Swedenborg happened to be particularly close to God and and prayerful, that it, this could not also have been given to him individually. That's, that's the gymnastics I had to go through. But the two pamphlets, one of them was about heaven, and it had different degrees of glory. Um, and... Uh, I don't, I don't know if it's exactly like our outer darkness, but not quite the same, you know, Christian traditional concept of hell or like the, the more modern concept of hell. And then the second one was about eternal marriage, which our guide also had talked to us about, uh, that they believe uh, marriage is eternal. And uh, they do all that. Uh, they just believe it is. So you, no um, exclusionary, uh, you know, uh, practices where everyone has to be a worthy uh, you know, member uh, or Swedenborgian, I guess I think you made that up. Um, but yeah, to no, be able great. to, to be married forever. Yeah. No, no, um, hoops to jump through, uh, for you or your family or friends to want to attend. So anyway, uh, Can yeah. Can I ask you so, a question? 
Yeah. Was the eternal marriage aspect of Swedenborgian, uh, well, Swedenborg's uh, uh, philosophy. Oh, my gosh. Was, was the eternal marriage, was that part of the heaven or the hell part? That's what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I don't have the pamphlet anymore. <laughs> okay. But speaking of, well, I guess that comes up later. So, yeah, I think I think that's it. Is that what you uh, wanted from me, Randy, or is there anything else? Yeah, that's beautiful. So, I, 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 full disclosure: these these structures were built um, after Joseph Smith left the area. But remember, Joseph Smith was uh, uh, was in Harmony, Pennsylvania, and these buildings are in Eastern Pennsylvania. So, going to um, uh, through these slides, I just want to give a sense of just the amount of sophistication and respect that a lot of people in that area had for Swedenborg. And then the next slide, and we can just go through with a second or two just to kind of show the, the lay of the land. Uh, yeah, the, going inside, I made, uh, I made friends with one of the ministers. He's kind enough to give me a private tour, a really stunning artwork. And the next slide, um, this is going inside. And the next one is kind of our landing spot. Um, I've been reading up on, and I've been on Zoom calls with the uh, Swedenborg uh, adherents, if you will, and they believe in continued revelation. They believe in three degrees of glory, which uh, I first learned from you, Maven, and thank you for that. Uh, the top degree is the celestial kingdom. That sounds a little familiar. Uh, they believe in eternal marriage, and if you don't believe me, there's a pamphlet uh, that the minister gave me. They believe that children have automatic heaven. And uh, Johnny Appleseed was uh, actually a, a real guy who was a missionary who was an adherent of this revelation. He went around teaching it throughout Pennsylvania and beyond. So this is just one of many examples of Christian theologies that would have most certainly been discussed at Dartmouth, later showing up as Mormon doctrines. And again, I have a hard time putting together the idea that these um, end up as Mormon doctrine, and yet God, Mormon God specifically, says that they're all wrong, they're all an abomination, uh, and they're, um, et cetera. So uh, if we're good, we'll go to the next one. So uh, here's the book, uh, Emanuel Swedenborg, and that's actually spelled two different ways. And then another book, um, about uh, switching gears from Swedenborg, uh, a book by Jonathan Edwards Neville. I think he's pro-Mormon, but he's talking about how uh, Jonathan Edwards, who I mentioned earlier, his his uh, sermons, the phraseology, ended up in the Book of Mormon. I don't know how that's faith-promoting, but apparently he does, and so that, there's a book for those who take that uh, position. Uh, the next slide is Greek mythology. Now, what happens here is Dr. John Smith, again, the relative of Joseph Smith at Dartmouth, um, discusses Greek mythology at some length in his theological lectures, but he doesn't discuss it as, it, he, he's more just kind of as an academic matter of fact about it. Uh, he's not adhering to it or adapting it into Christianity, but it's interesting that these concepts would be discussed, um, and Hiram Smith certainly would have learned about it, and let's take a look what they are. I thought uh, the uh, pre-existence, the concept of the pre-existence was unique to Mormonism. It's not. It's Greek mythology, and um, uh, Dr. John Smith mentions that numerous times. It talks about various degrees of glory. It talks about celestial, uh, as does Swedenborg. It talks about gods are like mortals, uh, it talks about multiple gods. It talks about multiple worlds and heavens. It talks, and the, this is an exact quote, uh, what Dr. John Smith says. He talks about a continuing sexual system, meaning that Christian God, who preexisted time, space, and matter, created life, which continued through the universe through um, sexual reproduction. So he talks about that. Um, and then he talks about rites for the dead. That's actually uh, where he's going a little off Greek mythology and talking about Egyptian uh, rites for the dead. All of these showed up later as uh, Mormon doctrines. If you can go to the next slide, I just want to make the point that as I read Dr. John Smith's uh, uh, theological lectures, 
I, I had these images kind of in my head, and they were very similar to the images I had in my head as I read the Book of Moses. Uh, just uh, gods are mortals, multiple gods, um, Kolob, all these kind of conversations sounded very much like Dr. John Smith's theological lectures on Greek mythology, at least to me. Um, any thoughts on that, folks? Yeah, I was going to bring up one thing. Uh, I may wait till the end, but I'll just put it in here so people can think about it, which mm -hmm. is this idea that there are all these different things being talked about. And as you said, Dr. John Smith is not endorsing Greek mythology as the true and correct doctrine, but he's going over it as part of his courses and he's going to go over some other things as well. And then the question being, so if Hiram Smith learns all this, if he passes some of this on to Joseph Smith, and if indeed this is the germination of some of these ideas later on in Mormon doctrine. Why would Joseph Smith be taking elements of Greek mythology and Greek philosophy and Egyptian stuff? Of course, we do have a certain book with from a scroll, uh, the book of Abraham, which has its own Egyptian pedigree. But still, why would he be incorporating these things that are pagan or non-Christian into a Christian religion such as Mormonism? And it was when I was thinking about this just last night, and I already shared this with you this morning, but I'll go ahead and share this with everybody else, is that it appears that the author of the Book of Mormon sees no problem with this. The author of the Book of Mormon appears to believe that God reveals truth to all nations, to all peoples, in their own tongue and in their own language, through their own teachers, and that God reveals as much truth to them as they are ready to receive. And I just want to read Alma 29, verse 8, which when I was thinking about it last night, really came with more power into my heart than any scripture had ever come into the heart of man before, as it relates to your idea here, Randy. For behold, the Lord doth grant unto all nations of their own nation and tongue to teach his word, yea, in wisdom all that he seeth fit that they should have. Therefore, we see that the Lord doth counsel in wisdom according to that which is just and true. So it sounds like the author of the Book of Mormon, or at least this passage, has no problem with God revealing truth. In fact, it's a doctrine here. He does reveal truth to everybody, uh, every nation, every tongue, every people. And he reveals it through people in that country, in that culture that he raises up to give as much truth as people can receive at the time. So. If this is correct, then it may be that Joseph Smith's view of a restoration was broader than just taking everything that had been restored in the Old Testament and bringing it up to speed and everything in the New Testament. But it may have been envisioned by him as broader to restore every truth that had ever been revealed by God to any nation through teachers in the past. Yeah, I get your point. Very good. And the next slide is Barron's take on it, which is uh, very similar to what you just kind of said. Again, Richard Barron's is the gentleman who did a lot of this fundamental research uh, that I hope people will get familiar with. But as a true believing Mormon, what he did was he, he says he goes through Dr. John Smith's theological lectures, which talk about Christianity, but on a basis that most Christians today would agree with. And then uh, separate and apart from that, he talks about Greek uh, mythology, but Barron's blends the two, just as Joseph Smith did, as support for these 20 points. And I'm not gonna go through all these 20 doctrines, but they're very distinctively Mormon doctrines. Um, the key point I'm trying to make is that all of these themes, all of these concepts were there and that Again, it's very interesting. They showed up later just as Barron's puts them blended together into uh, more distinctive Mormon doctrines. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we're we're done with uh, number three, and we got two more. The next one is Islamic belief. And um, here, I mean, I, you know, I didn't know this until I went to Egypt a few years ago, but uh, and I asked my guide about Muhammad because I, I just didn't learn a lot about Muhammad. I didn't know actually anything about Muhammad. He told me that uh, Muhammad had angelic visits. 
Uh, and by the way, this is uh, this is a, what a lot of what I'm saying is also uh, in the theological lectures of Dr. John Smith. But I, I will say that he's taking a uh, probably a negative point of view towards Islam in his lectures, just so sure. that that context is there. But uh, the angelic visits, a focus on one man, that one man being Muhammad. Uh, the the uh, Islam is has Abrahamic roots. Uh, in other words, they believe in the Old Testament. The theme there is that Christianity is on the wrong path, somewhat similar to Joseph Smith. Um, he was a post-New Testament prophet, so he's a prophet that came after Jesus by the tune of uh, hundreds of years. Uh, he produced new scripture, the Quran, and also the most distinctive of all characteristics of Mormonism, which is modern polygamy. Um this was a Masonic or a Islamic uh, belief. So if we can go to the next slide and, you know, it's it just in kind of going through this, um, the, these lectures, here's the Quran, modern scripture after uh, the Old Testament, certainly after the New Testament. And I didn't realize it, but uh, Islam believes that Jesus was a prophet. I, I, I didn't know that. Um, and the next slide is... Um, is let's get to polygamy. Um, I, I didn't know it till I was in Egypt and I found out for the very first time, uh, and I was in my 40s or 50s, but anyway, um, today Muslims can have up to four war, uh, wives. Uh, Mormonism really <laughs> kind of went way beyond that. Uh, there's on the right a picture of Joseph S. Smith and Joseph Smith. <laughs> I know there's Joseph F. Smith saying, "Hold my beer." <laughs> yeah. yeah, you want to you want to talk polygamy? Watch this. Uh, and then the next slide is the idea that you know if if you believe in polygamy, then the the Mormon Church is probably the right place for you because um, the next slide shows. Oh, I uh, sorry, I skipped ahead of my mind. Um, th this is problematic, um, certainly for me. That Joseph Smith practiced polygamy, polyandry, and child brides. And from 1833, with his first, quote, polygamous wife, also some people would call it an affair in Kirtland with Fanny Alger, to 2014 when the Gospel Topic Essays came out, Joseph Smith said in the history of the church, what a thing for a man to be accused of, a, of committing adultery and having seven wives when I can only find one. And that was the official narrative. Certainly I was taught it. I was taught that uh, Joseph Smith having uh, multiple wives was, was anti-Mormon lies. And then the Doctrine and Covenants, Section 101, reiterates that, uh, that, that, you know, Mormons are only allowed one wife. Then 2014, out comes the Gospel Topic Essays, and um, this really hit the news. The idea that this was known all along, A, doesn't change anything that for those who are not uh, attracted to polygamy. And number two, uh, this was genuine news. Up up until 2014, the church had officially denied it uh, in all its official documents. I realized that there were pockets of intellectual Mormon scholars that talked about it amongst themselves or wrote books that only the other uh, Mormon historians read. But to the general public, of which I would consider myself more a part of, uh, the New York Times, the BBC, NPR, uh, revealed for the very first time that these rumors and anti-Mormon lies and allegations about Joseph Smith were actually true. So that's just a historical background of, uh, of polygamy, uh, modern polygamy in terms of the timeline. The next slide is uh, Islamic beliefs, and I'm just going to just say it the way it is, uh, and Mormon beliefs are very much parallel, um, where Dr. John Smith at Dartmouth is talking about, you know, modern day polygamy. He's he's repulsed by it, it sounds like, reading between the lines. But nonetheless, Joseph Smith started polygamy and then Brigham Young, but right to today with Dallin Oaks and uh, Russell Nelson. So, um, in fact, we, if we go to the next slide, we can see Russell Nelson posing for a photograph and he has two wives next to him. Um, so... I, yeah, and I will add a little conjecture here. I'm all for consenting adults doing whatever they want. I really, it, it's none of my business as long as I, they're not hurting anybody. Um, but uh, the idea that we don't practice that is is just a false notion. 
Islam has a very strong influence in Mormonism, as I see it, particularly after reading the John Smith uh, theological lectures. So uh, I'm going to just pause to see if there's any comments before we move on to the uh, the last phase. Not for is, me. Is now a good Bill, time to put. Is now a good time to put the banner up just with the phone calls? I think it would be a great time. By the way, Bill, you've been monitoring the live chat at all? Uh, a little bit. Are there any comments or questions that have come up that this might be a good time to bring up? Uh, I haven't noticed that. The folks are having a lot of fun in the in the comments, but I haven't noticed any. Okay, specific cut questions. it out, guys. No more fun in the live chat. We've had enough fun in the live chat. Let's focus. <laughs> wow. I should talk whenever I go listen to somebody else's podcast. I'm I'm going crazy in the live chat myself. It is a lot of fun. Well, we're on the home stretch. We got seven more slides, and uh, we we're uh, done for the night. the uh, The next slide, Maven, please, is getting into Masonic rituals. Remember that um, Dr. John Smith was the chaplain of the Masonic Lodge in Dartmouth, and Hiram Smith himself was a Mason. I don't think I have a, a lot here to say that's new, but it was just interesting to get it from a uh, in and around Dartmouth perspective. Um, and that is well, Randy, um, Randy, can I just say that it's very common if you will find anybody in the church who will even talk about Joseph Smith's connections with masonry and how it influenced the endowment and the temple rights in Mormonism, usually they will only start in Nauvoo as if that was the first exposure Joseph Smith had to masonry and it was never in any church correlated materials that I found out that Joseph's brother Hiram was a Mason, his dad was a Mason, their dog for a time was a, no, everybody, almost everybody it seems, who was anybody was a Mason at the time. And then we also find out from the recent book about uh, Method Infinite, right? That even people who are not Masons were familiar with the rights of Masonry because there were so many exposés going on and public enactments of the secret rituals of masonry that it was very common for people to know what was going on even if you didn't have close relatives who were already masons yeah 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 and, and by the way i want to be respectful i'm not going to mention a word about mormon temple ceremonies all i'm going to talk about is masonic rituals the temple rituals and then people can draw their own conclusions uh but to go through that that's list, a good idea randy because you know what happens if you talk about Mormon temple rituals, don't you? I've heard. <laughs> I, I was just in London about a month ago on business, and uh, I, uh, there's a theory, one of the conspiracy theories out, is that Jack the Ripper was, the, the, whoever that wa the murderer was, those were Masonic killings, if you think about the uh, what the types of murders were. I, let's We'll get back on track. I, I saw, but, by the way, I saw that, Randy, and the, the uh, authorities, the law enforcement of the area, the allegation is that they were Masons too, and hence they were to some degree protecting him and sort of hiding the evidence. Yeah. And that's exactly right. As far as being one of the conspiracies. Yeah. 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 Again, whether it's true or not, who knows, but uh, there is one question actually here. Heber C. Kimball. What's that? I think it was actually Heber C. Kimball. Heber C. Kimball. Uh, yeah. Doug Vincent here says, Bill, my question, did Hiram actually graduate from Dartmouth? And I, I don't know if you know the answer, Randy, my assumption is no. I'm under the, it's a great question, Doug. Uh, my assumption is no, I haven't seen anything that said he did, uh, but this is a good point to point out that I am really f obviously fascinated with this time period, the Dartmouth period, and I am still doing lots of research. But uh, as far as I know so far, he did not. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Masonic, the, the whole masonry thing is a kind of a deist organization. At Dartmouth, there was an argument and a battle for the uh, board of trustees between masons and Christians. Uh, Christians obviously had their beliefs, and masons were more deist and universalists, which, which the Christians didn't like. Of course, masons have temples. They have a slogan, holiness to the Lord. Uh, their symbols include an all-seeing eye, uh, bees and deseret. Um, are terms from masonry, temple clothing and aprons, altars and rit ritualistic speech, blood, blood oaths and penalties, hand clasps, secret rituals, and the five points of fellowship. So if we can go to the next slide and just kind of um, 
talk about that. I mean, uh, masonry was a big deal uh, in that time frame in and around Dartmouth. Dr. John Smith, again, was the Masonic, uh, cha- the chaplain, not only of the Christian temple on Dartmouth campus, but of the Masonic temple in town. Uh, so how much of this got to Joseph Smith and Hiram? Um, certainly, I got to think some of it, but um, but that's kind of the, the landscape there. Um, any thoughts or comments there? Just just one uh, one quick note. This person here saying right online that Hiram was at Dartmouth, but actually attended the Indian school. True question mark. And I just want to I want to clarify on your behalf, Randy, because I think I think this is a big deal because I think apologists will jump in and go like, oh, he didn't actually go to Dartmouth. Uh, it says Hiram began attending Moore's Charity School, originally called Moore's Indian Charity School, which was located on the same campus at Dartmouth College, um, New Hampshire, approximately seven miles north. It, anyway, it says here. Though Moore's Charity School was technically a separate institution from Dartmouth at the time, the distinction was largely in name only. It, it's important for people to recognize that while he is at a separate school on the same campus as Dartmouth, it's only separate in name, and that the folks who went to the Indian school, and it's called an Indian school because they were training preachers to go preach to the Indians, is that they had the same access to the teacher's and the instruction, because it was essentially like a, uh, like a, like preparing them to then go further their education actually at the Dartmouth's building next door. Does yeah, that make well, sense? yeah, complete. Uh, well said, Bill. Um, the, I, here's the here's the deal. Uh, Richard Barons is pro Mormon. He's a true believing Mormon, or was, and he wrote the article that that made it clear that. Uh, Hiram Smith, and he got the school records, which I've still, I, I'm still waiting on Dartmouth to get to me. But, um, but the uh, more school, more academy, it was considered a prep school, and it was very much part of Dartmouth campus, like like uh, Barron said, and also Kathleen says in her book when she takes a more critical view. Um, it, all sides seem to agree in the academic literature I've read that Hiram Smith attended Dartmouth particularly more school, just like, it's kind of like saying um, Harvard, uh, or excuse me, Dartmouth Medical School is separate and apart. Well, it is as a school within Dartmouth, but you're lodged in Dartmouth Hall. Uh, You go to the same morning and night um, uh, lectures at Dartmouth Church. So to try and distance from it, um, yeah, it had a prior name, but uh, I think the academic literature I've read doesn't add up to what is suggested by, I think, uh, in the Williams Davis article. I just think it's important because it would be easy for apologists to come in and go, come on, like this, these guys aren't really saying it accurately. He went to a different school. It just happened to be on the same grounds. But as you're pointing out, multiple authors, and again, on both sides in instances, are saying for all intents and purposes, Hiram Smith went to Dartmouth. Well, when you live in Dartmouth Hall and go to classes in Dartmouth Hall and eat yeah. in Dartmouth Hall and go to the church across the street on Dartmouth campus, yeah, uh, I, I think it's safe to say went to Dartmouth. Yep, same thing. Yep, totally. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Hey, Randy, so when I, you're about ready to when you're about ready to wind up, I really want to go back to that quote that you started with from Joseph Smith because it really sounds like Hiram got the benefits of an incredible education for the time and for the family that he was part of, maybe because he was really smart, maybe it's because of the family connections, but he was at Dartmouth or the the more Indian school for four years is my understanding. And yet Joseph Smith does not appear to want to mention that when he could, in fact, he gives a different impression altogether. Say that again, RFM. This is the quote that uh, Randy has started with. There was a slide much earlier uh, where he talks about uh, we have all these children or my parents had all these children. I've got all these brothers and sisters and we had to work for a living. And so we were deprived of the benefits of an education speaking on behalf of himself and all the other kids, including Hiram. Yeah. Can I want to put can I just show just for a second? Let me just show you something. This is a letter by Joseph. By the way, as you pointed out in the beginning of the show, there's the argument that Joseph Smith only had three years of education by apologist. And uh, there's a really cool article. 
uh, written by, and I'll share it in the notes for this episode. William Davis wrote an article, Reassessing Joseph Smith Jr.'s Formal Education. He went and did all the research, and it's very well done. He makes the argument that Joseph Smith probably got three years of education very early on and probably totaled somewhere in the realm of about a total of seven full uh, years of schooling. And we have this idea. Emma Smith says that Joseph Smith could not have written or dictated a coherent letter. Here is 1829, Joseph Smith writing to Oliver Cowdery. First off, handwriting is quite well. Second is when you recognize going back to the 1800s, the the words would certainly be spelled wrong. And we might judge that in our 2023 sensibilities as being uh, uneducated. But the reality is there just wasn't a formal, um, what's the word? Kind of a, a standardized a, spelling correct. hadn't been standardized correct. yet. And so it was perfectly normal for the spelling to be off. But when you read again, you can read the transcript on the Joseph Smith papers. He writes a really well written letter. The idea that Joseph Smith was uneducated is in today's standard, once we have the evidence and we understand what's going on, it's it's preposterous. Now, I know that Lucy Max Smith said he wasn't given to much reading, but we also have a list of all the books he owned throughout his life, at least a bunch of them. And it's quite big. When he went, you mentioned, Randy, we he did the School of the Prophets. When he did the School of the Prophets, he was teaching grammar to the other people that were in the School of the Prophets. And he even went home and says he taught his family the science of grammar. We're just not talking about a dumb guy or an uneducated guy. Joseph Smith is educated to the degree that he got seven years of formal schooling, which isn't a ton, but he also had deep access to his brother who was coming home and was responsible during the leg surgery years of instructing Joseph and sharing with him what he was learning. Um, he was responsible to do that. Joseph Smith got a much bigger education than the apologists want to grant. And sure as hell is, what's his name? The general authority that was talking at the beginning of the show. Tad yeah, Callister. Uh, yeah. He's got a whole ton of more education than Tad Callister wants to admit. Or that, yeah, all points well taken. And what's interesting is that one of the books I uh, had to go through was the history of Joseph Smith by his mother, uh, Lucy Smack Smith. She's downplaying it too. Um, so, you know, I think uh, as RFM is prone to saying, lesser minds would say that the effort is to downplay Joseph Smith's actual uh, offloading um uh, of ed education from an Ivy League institution because the greater disparity between uh, him and his his uh, creations later on, th the better. Yeah, the dumber he is, the more miraculous the Book of Mormon becomes. By the way, Maven, are we able to go back to one of those earlier slides that has that quote from Joseph Smith? In his, it was his 1832 account. It was the letter book one the original account that he that he created. Uh, I'll look for it. It might take me a second. OK, thanks. OK, well, I mean, uh, I have a slide for this, but let, we don't need the slide per se. I want to go back to my original research question. What were the original sources for what later became Mormon doctrine? And we've talked about ancient American mythology. We've talked about Christianity. We've talked about Greek. We've talked about Islam. We talked about mas uh, masonry and Masonic rites. And the thing is, get this, and this is really kind of the punchline of what I've taken away from, from all this research so far, is how many 12-year-old boys, let alone a 12-year-old boy and his older 16-year-old brother, are conversant on the themes and concepts downloaded in and around Dartmouth over this period of time, when I think most 12-year-old boys, I'll just speak for myself, were concerned about chasing blue-bellied lizards, going to the beach, and riding our bikes uh, past the gr uh, houses of the cute girls in the neighborhood. I mean, they got a, a really incredible download of information. And what's even uh, uh, more interesting is it was offline. I think as Doug brought up earlier with this question, I, I don't see that he actually, uh, Hiram Smith, uh, actually got the degree. So all this information came in, and that's why I think uh, 
so many people, why, why they were so successful in keeping this download of, of information uh, quiet for so long. Oh, and just another thought too. One of the other things I've read in uh, William Davis's article was that in like 1821, 1822, Joseph Smith joins the debating. Let me see if I can find it here really quick. The debating club, yeah. Yeah, Joseph attended a juvenile debating society, 1821, 22. Uh, Joseph participated in this juvenile debate club, which reveals his interest in self-improvement and activity also suggests continued attendance at school. <clears throat> so the idea that, you know, the kind of folks who go the extra mile to, to, to join the debate club, th there's something at least um, anecdotally that it says about Joseph Smith and how much he valued learning. Um, a lot of these stories we tell about uh, the prophet and his being just a, a backwoods farm boy with no education. We have got to start treating this more seriously. I'll put another slide up on the screen really quick. Uh, this was one of the books in Joseph Smith's possession. Uh, this one's the 35th edition. He actually had one of the first editions, second editions. There was actually four editions, I think, printed the first year because there were three reprints because it sold so well. But it was a book, uh, and, and they say that Joseph Smith would not have gotten this from the school. He would have gone and bought, in this, uh, bought this himself. Uh, and so it's simply to note that when Emma says Joseph Smith couldn't have dictated or written a letter, a coherent one, we already know just by that 1829 handwritten letter by Oliver Cowdery, that's nonsense. Also, when Lucy Max Smith says that her son wasn't given to much reading, that's also nonsense. When you understand the life of Joseph Smith and you look at the evidence, it becomes crystal clear that this kid was voraciously reading and that he was smart uh, as a whip. And, and we've got to start acknowledging that. It's one thing to go, I have faith in the church, but you can't throw out the old narratives that don't hold up anymore. They just don't work. Uh, well, absolutely, Bill. And you'd look at the happiness letter. Well, he dictated that, and that's elegant. I mean, it's, uh, you know, par a parts of it are conveniently quoted to this day. And it was clearly from the mind of somebody who had uh, a, a quite, a, quite an intellect. Can we get that slide back up there? Because we never quite got back to that. I just wanted to bring up this fact that in 1832, Joseph Smith knows presumably that his older brother went to Dartmouth for four years. And yet when he's writing about his family, he says, we were obliged to labor hard for the support of a large family having nine children. And as it required the exertions of all that were able to render any assistance for the support of the family, therefore we were deprived of the benefit of an education. Now that's interesting to me that even though he knows about Hiram's education, he glosses over it in this document. And it makes me wonder why. Why is it that he wants to not mention Hiram's education at Dartmouth? And is there a reason he doesn't want to mention it? And is the reason he doesn't want to mention it because that's where a lot of his information came from? Also, if you remember the 1826 trial episode we did, he even attended school uh, for a year in Bainbridge uh, with Josiah Stoll's son. And everywhere the Smiths moved, by the way, if you go back and read William Davis's article, everywhere the Smiths moved, there were other kids similar in age to Joseph Smith in the neighborhood who have remembrances of him being a student with them in school. So again, this idea that he had two or three years, four years of education is just nonsense. Yeah, complete. And how do you, I, I don't see a possible of reconciling all of this with a statement from Joseph Smith's own hand that we, meaning all me and the nine children in the Smith family, were deprived of the benefit of an education at a time where his son was going to an Ivy League school, getting an Ivy League education, and then in turn coming back home right down the street and tutoring Joseph Smith himself for four years. We've talked about this for an hour and 40 minutes. Remember this, these conversations going on at Dartmouth in and around Dartmouth were going on for years. So there was an enormous amount of information conveyed directly into Joseph Smith. Well, this totally changes my view of Joseph Smith from somebody who's out there. 
he's uh, putting the chains around the stumps and hooking them up to the harness on the mule. And he's clearing fields and he's pulling sticks and he's digging wells. And that's it. That's all he's doing until Moroni shows up and gets things going. But apparently that's not the case. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, it's, it's not the case. Um, so, Maven, if you go to the I think it's slide 78 and I just have two more slides uh, and then uh, that that will wrap up what I've got so far. Yeah, right there, Maven. Um, the Dartmouth period. This is kind of the whole kit and caboodle from what we've talked about, where we started off with ancient American mythology. Uh, clearly, it fueled a big speculative uh, discussion on where these people came from that resulted in Solomon Spalding, Ethan Smith, you know, again, uh, the Dartmouth connection. And, and, and now I will add a little conjecture. Uh, my belief is that the Book of Mormon is really a combination of ancient American mythology and Christianity. And that's why um, I think Sandra Tanner so brilliantly pointed out that one of the most remarkable things about the Book of Mormon is that in its foreword, it says that it contains the fullness of the gospel, and yet it doesn't have anything about the preexistence, eternal marriage, uh, all the things we consider unique Mormon doctrines. It certainly doesn't talk about Masonic temple rites. It doesn't talk about uh, uh, pol uh, polygamy as as uh, as far as it being a, 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 a wonderful uh, thing to get involved with. That's the Book of Mormon. Then as we go around the wheel to Greek mythology, that's where we get the pre-existence. And, and remember, the timeline of Mormonism, right after uh, uh, the Book of Mormon came out, Joseph Smith almost immediately started in on uh, the Joseph Smith translation, which comes uh, from, uh, in large part, uh, Adam Clark. Uh, but that's not to say it, it, there's other aspects of the Joseph Smith uh, translation that came from non-Adam Smith resources or sources. But Hundreds did come from Adam Clark. So that was his next production. Then his next production, as we go to Islam, is the angelic, you know, more of the angelic visits and, and uh, uh, most importantly, modern polygamy, which still remains in place in this to, to, today. And then we find the final wheel is uh, the Mormon Masonic temple rites, which are so parallel. Um, and there's a gospel topic essay on that. Now, again, my, my opinion, my conjecture, others are welcome to, to take a different point of view, but this really shows the building blocks of Mormonism. It's these five things, um, which I didn't really realize until I did this research, because I'm fascinated by ancient American mythology. I, I, testified in federal court about it. I, I've gone coast to coast and I've got to uh, civilizations around the world studying it. It's so interesting to me, but it's not my religion. It's not, I don't, I don't speculate on where they came from and then build my belief system around it. Um, Greek, Greek mythology, again, uh, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, brilliant, interesting. I love reading it, but again, it's not my belief system with Greek gods and multiple gods and heavens and so forth. Islam, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say what I really believe. I don't, I, I'm repulsed by polygamy. I think it's it's uh, mistreating women. And I respect the fact that a consenting adults can do what they want. But I also respect my position that I don't like it. I would have, I would personally never have anything to do with it, uh, thinking clearly. And then Masonic, Masonic temple rites, that's something that's never appealed to me. Um, but yet this is what we're sold in Mormonism are these five components. Hmm. Can I just say that one of the things that I find attractive about this idea that you've presented is that it limits the resources that Joseph Smith has to have access to in order to come up with these ideas. I know it's very common for people to try and trace down every single one of these concepts and go to different books or different libraries or different people that Joseph Smith had to be almost as brilliant as he would have had to have been divinely inspired to track all these things down and incorporate them all into his system. But as I say, I think the attractiveness of this is that it limits that kind of resource access that Joseph Smith had to have contact with in order to come up with these different ideas. I think you're making a good point and maybe to it's it, again, we're making again, the automatic writing episode we did a few weeks ago, 
um, I think was brilliant. And it posits a theory about how the Book of Mormon could have been done. And all you have to do now, if the automatic writing is the way in which it happened, all you have to do now is fill Joseph Smith's subconscious with ideas and thoughts that can come out as the Book of Mormon. For instance, his father's dream, the sermons of the ministers of his day, books that he had read. And what Randy's doing tonight is offering one more of those. And the apologists can look at this and Elder Holland, for instance, when uh, in his talk about going under, around and through, he goes, oh, Solomon Spaulding and Ethan Smith. And the reality is all you have to do as a critic is show a valid argument for how the information that's contemporary to Joseph Smith got into his mind. And once you do that, all you're left with is to figure out, like, is it possible that Joseph Smith on some level is either using um, information that other people are not aware that he's using during the translation, such as your episode with the possibility of documents in the hat, for instance, or to show that there is some other way in which Joseph Smith could be accessing ideas that are inside his head. And, and I would just say that I think at this point it can be shown that Joseph Smith essentially has all the material for the Book of Mormon, either access to it in his community or inside of his own head. And at that point, the most rational conclusion is not that Joseph Smith was translating an ancient work by ancient prophets in this land for which there's no evidence that that is the case. Rather, it's much more likely, exponentially more likely, that he is creating a fictional work, borrowing from the substance of his milieu. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there was a comment uh, that I saw come across saying I had, uh, you know, not seen 99% of this before. And I have to sympathize with that listener because that's exactly how I felt doing this research. I had a hunch talking to RFM. I acted on the hunch. I found this article couldn't believe what I was reading, even as a, a post-Mormon myself. And so I started flying there and, and going there and talking to people and digging and digging. And I, I want to thank the Dartmouth Library because they're very helpful in my multiple requests, uh, which are still ongoing. But it is brand spanking new, at least speaking to myself. I can't imagine the gaslighting gonna, that's going to come where people say, oh, of course we knew that. Because Matt, Neil A. Maxwell said in 1992 that the Dartmouth doctors, uh, doctors were from Dartmouth. Um, sorry, uh, I was pretty well schooled in Mormonism, having an undergrad from BYU and seminary and teaching the MTC, et cetera, et cetera. And for this to escape my attention, I got to think it escaped about everyone's attention. Yeah. Um, just a note, Dan Vogel, and I, I think Dan's brilliant, and he's far better than me in almost every instance. But he says, when you name a source, you need more evidence to prove that use. And I actually disagree. If you can show an argument that is as plausible or more than the Book of Mormon itself's proposed narrative of how we got it, then I think you're far enough along that a rational critical thinker can side with a contemporary source for which we can't have a direct conclusion, but we can show that Joseph Smith had potential access to it because the Book of Mormon's claims are far more stretched in terms of being an ancient work by ancient prophets with so much 19th century overlap and for which no archaeological uh, evidence exists. So I don't think you really have to prove Joseph Smith read all these things. You only have to show that it's more plausible that he did than what kind of allowances and conjecture require are required to believe the Book of Mormon is an ancient text. Yeah, and that plus, I mean, the John Smith uh, theological lectures, which I got the source documents, uh, the stuff I've talked about is either in here or in the immediate vicinity of Dartmouth. This is this is not uh, this is not a theory on my part. This is pretty much factual. Again, don't believe a word I say. I I but research what I say. I think you'll you know the facts are the yeah. facts. And I guess to make my point clear, for instance, if you're going to argue that there's unicorns, and I'm going to argue that there's Bigfoot, and those two contradict each other, which they don't, but if those two contradicted each other the potential of Bigfoot actually outweighs the potential of unicorns. 
And hence, if I have to pick one of them, if I'm forced into a corner and I've got to pick one or the other, the reality is I would have to pick Bigfoot. And so you don't have to show that an argument is you're waving your head. But if you don't have to show an argument is proven to be true, only that it's a better argument than the other possibility that you're being forced to choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that that's basically where I am with my research now. I can get more into my conjecture if you want or not. Uh, but um, I feel pretty I feel pretty good that these are the five building blocks of Mormonism. One one researcher uh, told me, "Hey, you know, you need to research each one of these points and exclude any other evidence of any other resource that Joseph Smith might have ever had to be to basically pin this on." On Dartmouth, well, that's a fool's errand because uh, a I I'm not a researcher in that uh, with with I'm not a historian is what I'm saying I'm not a Mormon historian I'm a regular guy who happens to have a unique uh, research capability but I am not making any claim of exclusivity so with with not making that claim I don't need to go chasing uh, rainbows and butterflies and unicorns trying to you know, dissect what, where Joseph Smith learned things and where he didn't, that's, that's just an impossibility. Okay. What do you think RFM? I don't know. I'm kind of leaning toward unicorns. If you, <laughs> at least, at least there's photos <laughs> of guys in costumes <laughs> and footprints. Again, both. Yes. Are, Again, not not comparable to Randy's argument, but both are absurd. See, the idea that Dan's saying is like, maybe that's absurd if you can't prove he read it. And the reality is, as long as it's less absurd than the proposed narrative of the Book of Mormon, you still have to go with the more rational argument. If I'm forced into a corner to pick between Bigfoot and unicorns, Bigfoot is the more rational argument, even if both are absurd. It, you don't have to prove things. You only have to show that there's a better possibility to let go of the old one. Okay. And I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah. But, okay. but the fact that Hiram Smith was immersed in yeah. this Ivy league culture for four years, most certainly came in contact himself with this. And all I'm saying is, isn't it interesting that they show up later as Mormon doctrine? And the example I have is from childhood is, you know, I'm from Southern California. We always got sunburns at the beach and somebody mentioned just the concept, just the theme, aloe vera. And I didn't even know, I never heard the word before. So I asked my mom, what's aloe vera? Oh, it's a plant. Uh, it, what, what does it do? Da, 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 da. And I, I'd ask around and I found out a neighbor had a plant. I cut a lead off, leaf off. I squeezed it. I put the gel on my sunburn and my sunburn went away you know, big time. It was just that concept that grew into more and more action that evolved into something practical. Um, but all I'm saying is that the concepts were there. I think that's factual. Um, and it, anybody that actually gets the source documents, I think comes to the same conclusion. And isn't it interesting that these concepts later ended up uh, being taught uh, as doctrine in the Mormon church? That's, that's basically it. Yeah, I'm still struck by this anomaly that Joseph Smith apparently wants to downplay, and the church certainly wants to downplay and not mention this four years at Dartmouth by Hiram, and then cross-reference that with what a shadowy figure Hiram is in church history. At least as it's taught in the LDS church, everybody knows him, but what do we know about him? He's there. He's kind of in the background. What's he doing? I don't know. Yeah, I just yeah, I, wanted I, to I, point out this uh, question here. Um, Doug Vincent had seen on, on an earlier slide that Deseret comes from Mason Marine was asking about that. Like where that came from. Oh, uh, just Google it. Uh, it's I, I think it, I think it's safe to say it's common knowledge. It Deseret means uh, industrious and it was uh, originally a Masonic term. Just just Google Deseret and the word uh, masonry, and you'll see loads of stuff there. And it, just a note too, um, Richard Bushman, I mean, these quotes, I think, and he said this in an interview I did with him. He said, and then there is the fact that there is phrasing everywhere, long phrases, that if you Google them, 
You'll find them in 19th century writings. The theology of the Book of Mormon is very much, and again, this is an LDS faithful scholar, previous stake president, patriarch. Um, I think he's holding emeritus status in that, but he's still a patriarch. Uh, very much 19th century theology. It reads like a 19th century understanding of the Hebrew Bible as an Old Testament. Uh, and then somewhere else he said, the Book of Mormon has a lot of 19th century Protestant material in it, both in terms of theology and wording. I, I think any intellectual person now in Mormonism, Terrell Givens, Patrick Mason, you name them, I think they would all, if you ask them, they would all agree that the Book of Mormon contains a significant amount of 19th century contemporary material. So we're going to have to figure out where all that comes from. And it didn't come from Moroni and it didn't come from Nephi. And the Dartmouth connection here uh, explains all those essential items. And when you combine that with, again, Joseph Smith Sr.'s dream, the, the sermons of the ministers in Joseph Smith's neighborhood, and all the other places, you have a much more rational explanation for the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Yeah, and, and this is a book that just came in today, again, written by Jonathan Edwards Neville, uh, which uh, John, uh, Jonathan Edwards is one of those uh, early Christian theolo theologians. Here's a whole book of phraseology from his sermons that are found in the Book of Mormon. So now uh, it's really kind of exciting because I think the question of, you know, is the authenticity of the Book of Mormon with DNA and anachronisms and uh, linguistics and the Book of Abraham and the fact that clearly the, uh, the papyrus doesn't, or the facsimiles don't match the text. I think that those points are brilliantly made. The question, next question is, okay, now that we know that the official narrative doesn't hold up, the next horizon is, okay, where did these, uh, where did this content come from that are mo modern Mormon doctrines? And I think that's what we need to do more research on. Yeah. Can I just uh, intrude myself here to say, I think it may be that bees are common to masonry as a symbol of industry, and the Mormon twist on it is to put the word Deseret on it. I'm going to bait you a big steak dinner on that. Uh, I think I think Deseret is an actual Masonic term, but I could be wrong. Okay, so big steak dinner, yeah. and this is an official bet, and we are virtually shaking hands on this bet right now? Yes, and I. by the way, I like the sautéed little mushrooms on my steak. Okay, well, I've got it because I don't like any mushrooms on my steak, just so you know. Okay. <laughs> and we're talking T-bone, baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you guys ready for a few phone calls? Yeah. I think we're going to have to let Cheryl Bruno be the uh, moderator on this, this bet. She can tell us the answer. Oh, I'm sorry. Any callers being patient in the queue? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Exactly. Callers, callers. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I'm going to go to Thomas Murphy first. So Thomas Murphy, LDS uh, Mormon scholar, I should say. He covers Mormonism in a lot of his writings. Uh, Thomas, are you there? I'm here. Awesome, my friend. Go ahead. You're on Mormonism Live. Oh, well, this is a fascinating episode. Uh, Randy, it's uh, quite, quite a bit of research you put together, quite a fascinating and compelling argument. I, I do so somewhat lean a little bit with Dan that, you know, there, there is a little more, another step in the process of, of you know, establishing connections. But I think the, the big picture that you pre, uh, presented is, is quite compelling. The one thing I want to kind of add to it, I guess, and uh, kind of delineate a little bit of my different way of approaching this, uh, some of the listeners I'm sure heard episode 72, uh, Neophytes and Lamanites, where I talked about the connections between Amores Indian Charity School uh, at Hiram Smith and Native Americans uh, in the Book of Mormon. And when we emphasize Dartmouth rather than Moore's Indian Charity School, I see us doing a disservice to the Native American contributions to the creation of, of Dartmouth. And so in my writing, at least, uh, I could emphasize Moore's because it's actually more, more precise uh, to say Moore's Indian Charity School than it is to say Dartmouth. Uh, and because, uh, let's give you an example of its relevance to the Book of Mormon. The person that's really behind uh, the, the fundraising that took place 
uh, to create Dartmouth is a man, Mohegan man by the name of Samson Oakham. And he was the first native student that Eliza Wheelock, who was the founder of Moors and then later Dartmouth, uh, that he recruited to attend the school. And, and Moors was designed to train uh, people to be missionaries to the Indians, as well as uh, after his success with Samson Oaken, of training uh, native people themselves uh, to be uh, missionaries to their own people and to provide the language skills and training for uh, native missionaries. Well, Samson Oaken has been proposed as a model for Samuel the Lamanite uh, by uh, Rick Grunder and by uh, Lori Taylor. And I kind of echo that uh, myself in my writing. But so you've got this Mohegan man who plays this fundamental role in helping to create. He does. He goes to England, helps Elisa Waylock raise all this money for the Dartmouth. He comes back and he gets in a little dispute with with uh, Wheelock about the appropriate uses of the money, uh, and he gets kind of sidelined. And Wheelock uses the money that Samson Mokum raised to create Dartmouth. Uh, that ends up replacing ultimately Moore's in the charity school. And so it's kind of a tragic story, but it also has a fascinating connection to the Book of Mormon in that uh, Sam Samokan may very well be a model for Samuel the Lamanite. And in that episode, I talked uh, a lot more about several other characters in the Book of Mormon that uh, are connected, that have similar names to Book of Mormon characters and biographies that are all interrelated to Moore's Indian Charity School. Awesome. Thank you, Thomas. Dr. Murphy, thank you so much. This is one of the things I love about this show is we can have this research that Randy's put together, and then we can have people like you, Dr. Murphy, calling in and even giving additional insights and connections with Dartmouth and Moore's Charity Indian School. Well, yeah, amen to that. And it's, yeah, uh, Tom, to have you call in is just really an honor in and of itself, uh, given your scholarship. I, and I, on your, you made four points as I, as I took it. The first one on the need for more research, I could not agree more. Um, I'm my my ob objective, as I said it on the on onset, was to uh, bring the Barron's article out of obscurity uh, and give uh, Mr. Barron's the credit he deserves for that and build on it. The second point about Moore's Academy, I, the way I understand it, I could be wrong, is that historically, before, meaning before Hiram Smith got there, it was indeed called the Moore Charity School and the Moore Indian, um, I forget the particular name, but it, I, as I understand it, at the time that Hiram Smith attended, it was called Moore Academy. Uh, so on, on that point, I think Moore Academy is, uh, and again, I could be wrong, is the right term. But on the point of calling it Moore Academy and not Dartmouth, I mean, I attended the Anderson School of Management at UCLA. Most people uh, in everyday life have never heard of uh, Anderson School of Management. Uh, and so when people say, where did you go to grad school? I say UCLA. I think it's fair as to do exactly what I said uh, and, and did tonight is, is say, we're talking about Dartmouth and a school within Dartmouth. I was very clear and upfront about that uh, in the onset. But my first point, f fourth point, and final point in in uh, in responding to your your really great comments is I would love to hand things off to a brilliant church proper church historian or collaborate. Uh, all I'm all I'm saying is I would love more to come out of this topic. I don't. I'd be the first to admit I'm probably not the right person not being a historian to do that, but I would love to collaborate or hand the ball off to somebody who's going to really take the ball and run home with it. Yeah. And, and I think too, uh, Thomas makes a great point that we honor the Native American heritage when we refer to the school by that name. And when we're trying to posit ideas around where Joseph Smith got his material, it's also important that we not allow a distinction to be made if it's not fair to make a distinction and to separate those schools if it if it's crucial to the argument that Joseph Smith's brother was at Dartmouth and in fact he was. So I think both those points hold value and 
I don't know how to do that fairly, but, but I think they're both true. Like you have to honor that it is Dartmouth and you have to honor the Native American heritage and refer to it uh, by that name as well. Yeah, well said, yeah, Bill. And I, I think that's, yeah, that's what I was emphasizing is why I choose to yeah. use the name Moore's. Totally. Uh, Moore's, more so than offering a criticism of, uh, of what you're doing, Randy. I, I, I understand the connection and Dartmouth certainly uh, has a much better name recognition uh, than Moore's. Uh, and uh, I would love to talk to you about collaborating. I'm in my book. I'm working on you know, native native stories uh, and the connection to the Book of Mormon. And really, Dartmouth and Moore's is like the nexus of connection uh, between the Smith family uh, and uh, the people. Uh, the neophytes, if you will, the missionaries that are uh, converting Native Americans, who they refer to as neophytes, uh, and and that really is the connection. There is a great book I do want to recommend for those who might be interested in uh, the Native side of it. is It's by Colin Calloway, who was a professor at Dartmouth, and it's called The Indian History of an American Institution, Native Americans in Dartmouth. Uh, and that's a great resource uh, for uh, those who are interested in learning more about the Native uh, perspective. Uh, and I will add one other interesting factor that uh, there was a, class, a couple of several classmates of Hiram's that were Native, uh, one of whom was uh, Jacob Jameson. Uh, and Jacob Jameson's grandmother, Mary Jameson, had written a book that was published in Common Dagua. Uh, <clears throat> shortly before, or in, I think, about 1824. Uh, and it has a number of parallels uh, with the Book of Mormon. Uh, and Jacob uh, went to Western New York uh, around the same time that the Smith family moved there, and went back there because he was from there. Uh, and uh, it has been uh, proposed as a possible uh, conduit of some of the, the similarities between indigenous stories uh, and some of the Book of Mormon stories. Well, well, Tom, uh, where you said that you would uh, entertain a conversation on collaboration, I, I, you've made my day. <laughs> you know, uh, the six months of research are worth it to, to hear that from a scholar like you. I, uh, I, and, and I get your points. I think every point you made is valid. The uh, the yeah. Barron's article, he he talks about it, and he went to Dartmouth. He he talks about it as Dartmouth. But your points are well taken, and I certainly hope uh, the last thing I've uh, uh, hope I'm guilty of is is inferring any or distracting from the the importance of the Native American community because I obviously have a lot of respect for those folks. So uh, thanks for your comments. They're just terrific. I can't wait to talk to you more. Perfect. Thanks, Thomas. You're welcome. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Looks like we've got Andrew on the line. Um, Andrew, you're on the line. You're on Mormonism Live. Hello. How are you? Hi. I'm good. How are you? Good, good, my friend. What's uh, what's on your mind? Well, you guys made me homesick with the Dartmouth sweatshirts tonight. I uh, I grew up in Hanover, and uh, so <laughs> yeah, this was uh, this was bringing me uh, was making me homesick. So, um, just a couple of things I, I was that caught my attention today. Uh, first of all, I, I don't know if I'd want to even call it pushback, but this idea that uh, Dartmouth was a very prestigious institution back in the early 1800s is, you know, at least from what I always understood, you know, my dad worked for Dartmouth and that was, you know, Hanover and Dartmouth are one of the same. 1800s Dartmouth was just a small, obscure little school. Uh, and it certainly was not, I mean, the idea of Ivy league, I don't think even, I don't think it was really a thing until the early 1900s. Um, Dartmouth was just a tiny little school and that, you know, Hanover's rural area, even today. And back then it was even more so. Uh, so I don't think it's something that Joseph would, would necessarily be trying to hide, you know, and say, Oh, my brother Hiram went to a, 
a big prestigious Ivy League school because at that time that wasn't really the uh, that wasn't really what Dartmouth was. It was not a big prestigious Ivy League school like it like we have today. I, so, I, I do think um, though I do think though that RFM made a great point there, which is that if if Joseph Smith was getting his information from Hiram, if Hiram's coming home every day during these leg surgery years, and because Joseph was again, I think had some sort of limitation or severe limitation for about four years. Um, whatever conversations Hiram had, if Joseph Smith got any of the Book of Mormon from those conversations, it would benefit Joseph to Joseph Smith to obscure that. And so when RFM pointed out that that wasn't talked about when in the perfect place where it should have been, then at least it gives us pause to say, why is Joseph Smith choosing to omit his brother's, uh, above and beyond high school, his education. And and that seems strange. Right. I, I, and I, yeah, I don't want to, I'm not going to argue against that. I just, yeah. it, that's why I said, I don't even know if I'd even call it pushback. Yeah, it yeah. was just more of this idea that Dartmouth was a hugely prestigious institution back in the early 1800s. Totally. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think Dartmouth almost, uh, there was questions about Dartmouth survival, even up until the late 1800s. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't until the late 1800s, early 1900s that it really became, a, a prominent institution. So, um, but another thing I wanted to mention, which I thought was really interesting, um, was, so when I was growing up in Hanover, the ward there, we did not have our own building. We actually met at the elementary school, but, uh, whenever we had ward activities, a lot of our ward activities, like Christmas parties, that sort of thing, we actually held at the church of Christ at Dartmouth, that very building that Hiram was, uh, being educated in. Uh, and I wish I had known that when I was growing up, it was, you know, it would have been very interesting to realize, Hey, this is where Hiram Smith was getting his education to, that led to a lot of the foundation of the church. Um, so anyway, I just thought that was, uh, you might find that interesting that, yeah, the, the, even the modern day church of Christ of Dartmouth has a Mormon connection, at least from the 1980s. Yeah, that is interesting, Andrew. And wouldn't it be fascinating if it turned out that Dartmouth was the cradle of Mormonism? <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> be quite interesting. You were there. Yeah. <laughs> yep, I was there. I was the only Mormon kid at Hanover High School when I was growing up. So there was certainly not a lot of Mormon connection there at the time. But yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Well, and I, if I could just thank uh, you, right. yeah, Andrew, thanks oh. for calling. Um, a couple of things I learned is that King George from England commissioned uh, the Ivy, what later became called the Ivy League. So Dartmouth was was part of that uh, King George uh, commission. The and and walking around the Dartmouth campus as I did pretty extensively. Uh, Dartmouth Hall, which is still by today's standard, very impressive, very iconic, was in place at the time Hiram Smith uh, was there. The the ch uh, the White Chapel I already mentioned was was established, and the hotel that I stayed at across the street, which is owned by Dartmouth, which is a very substantial complex, was there. I you know of course a lot of buildings have been born, uh, you know burnt down and so forth, but I would I would probably point out that there was uh, there was some substantial. Uh, features of Dartmouth University at the time Dartmouth attended, and the medical theater. Uh, the the reason why they were able to keep uh, Joseph Smith's leg intact and not amputate it was because they had a a, the, a, a surgical theater which is still there today, um, which is a big glass dome that allows a lot of light in and a lot of students to stand around or sit around and watch the surgeries being performed. So I would say from what I saw. And maybe you're in a better position for me, Andrew, uh, having you grown up in Hanover. But from what I saw, Dartmouth was pretty substantial at the time Hiram Smith was there. Hmm. All right, we've got one more call. It is, I think the name is Baron. Uh, Baron. Baron, is that the name? Cheryl. So, sorry, say that again. Cheryl. Cheryl? Cheryl, go ahead, Cheryl. I, I don't Hi. know why it says that, but go ahead. You're on Mormonism Live. 
Who wins the steak dinner if that's Cheryl Bruno? <laughs> yes, Cheryl Bruno. Hey, I wanted to thank Maven for the shout out to our book method infinite. I saw it come up. That was awesome. Thank you. And um, to, as to who wins the steak dinner, drum roll, please. It is RFM. Deseret is not a Masonic term. However, um, <laughs> I see you cheering. Um, however, um, uh, the honeybee is quite a symbol in masonry, as Randy pointed out, and he is he's right on that. That 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 bee is a is a very uh, strong symbol. So um, it's not only represents industry, but it's like has a lot of esoteric hidden meanings and is very very masonic. But Deseret, no, that's Mormon. So. <laughs> thank you. Cheryl, thank Sorry you. I want you to say whatever other comments you want to have to make, but I just have three words to say right now. T-bone, no okay. mushrooms. <laughs> I'm just glad we didn't mention anything about dessert. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I pay all my bets. There you all right. go. Thank you for, thanks for the catch. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. So, well, I, I really want to thank Randy for his fabulous research on Dartmouth and Masonry. Um, we saw a lot of Masonic connections coming out of Dartmouth um, when we were researching the book. They didn't all make it into the book, um, but uh, there's a lot. Nathan Smith, of course, a Freemason. All of his interns were also Freemasons. And I seem to recall a source talking about them walking down the street in a parade, maybe dressed in Masonic regalia or something. But there is a lot of Masonic influence coming out of Dartmouth. So that was a fabulous point there. Um, Hiram was definitely influenced while he was there by Masonry. So one thing I do want to mention, though, that I was concerned about was um, your John Smith picture in a lot of your slides. Um, that is not Dr. John Smith. The picture that you have is John Smith, Uncle John Smith, who was um, Joseph Smith Sr.'s brother. And so it's a little confusing when <laughs> you've got that picture on so many slides. But, um, yeah, I noticed that that was um, that was not oh. the Dr. John Smith that you're talking well, about. You know, I, uh, maybe you know better than me, but uh, I understood that given the, you know, uh, Joseph Smith Sr.'s parents' cousin. It was simpler for some people to say he was Joseph Smith or Hiram Smith's uncle. Maybe I was mistaken in that. And that's what I love about this is that I, I if there's an error, I would certainly want to be the first to correct it. Um, so you're sure it was uh, the wrong wrong guy? Am I getting you right? And, and just the yeah, yeah, it, 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 okay. it is. It is the their birth dates and death dates is they're close. But yeah, they are two different people. Okay, well then we'll have to fix that. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Cheryl. And that's all I have for you tonight. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Cheryl. Good night. Good night. All right, there it is. Great job, Randy. I, would I mean, that a profitable evening. Evening. what's that? I would consider that a profitable evening. Yeah, that was super awesome. By the way, I owe you the steak dinner anyway because you got me this wonderful T-shirt, Randy. <laughs> no, I, I pay okay, my. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Everybody yes. got you get a T-shirt and you get a T-shirt and you get a T-shirt. Well, all I can say is mission accomplished. We're talking about something that really needs to be talking about. Refining the conversation. Thanks to all you guys, really, and and Maven. Uh, thanks for all your help with Swedenborg. Absolutely. And speaking of T-shirts, if uh, if others uh, buy any, um, Exmo shirts has Ooh. our Mormon discussions line here. Wow. So um, and yes, and all all of the other yeah, but of course there are also our logos. Um, and uh, yeah, so just a quick shout out there. Plug in the merch. Let's go. Love it. Any chance we can get multiple colors on that Radio Free Mormon T-shirt? I'm getting tired of just the white. Yeah, yeah. When you let's see, actually, I don't know. I think there's some. Um, let's try to order one right now. While we're on. I don't think so. There we go. <laughs> um, black, black, white, white or gray. gray. Let's see the gray one. Oh, great! I feel like I'm buying a 
Model T. I don't know if it refreshes. <laughs> That's an old joke. <laughs> the old the old joke about like, Model T's was you can get them in any color you want as long as it's black. Yeah, I I most of mine I think I bought in black. I, is is Mormon yeah. discussion available in three colors? I mean, maybe he's got a. I think maybe it's he's all got a, a special feature here. I don't. Yeah. I don't know. No, it's it's those three. Okay, love it. <laughs> Anything else, you guys? No, that's it. Nope, I'm Dr. Dead. Bell, Randy, thank you so much for coming on the show. He has been working on this for months now. And if you notice the Christmas lights around the Joseph Smith uh, Memorial <laughs> birth placement, 38 and a half feet high for the years he lived, right? Uh, all the Christmas lights, that's because that's when he was over there. He flew out there specifically for this reason. He's visiting places like nobody's business. He's going to where? All the places that you showed, all the pictures yeah. that you took. Yeah. And so yeah. doing all this research and it's just one, and talking to people and making friends and acquaintances at the library at Dartmouth. Uh, just fantastic research, Randy. Thank you so much for sharing that tonight with hey, our audience. Thanks for letting me share it with, uh, with, with you folks. And thanks for all the great comments. And uh, let's just keep the conversation going because I think we're on to something big here. Wouldn't it be awesome if something came out in the next, uh, whatever, a few years with uh, Randy Bell and Thomas Murphy? Uh, oh, on what a subject. dream. What a yeah. dream. A lot yeah, of awesome. love for you here. I just put up a comment. They want you uh, back on sometime. So thanks, Randy. Uh, <laughs> Very nice. Well, we'll come back and report up the conversation when we uh, when I pay that, uh, pay that bet on the steak dinner. <laughs> yeah, I think there is another conversation between for Randy to have. So I'm just waiting for... For Randy to have it. Yeah. Well, anytime you want me, I'm all yours, you guys. I, I love you guys. And by the way, I, I just last comment out of me is I've seen the amount of work you guys have done behind the scenes. You know, I've been calling RFM at all kinds of weird hours, running things by them. And uh, so let's step it up and donate because this content is uh, worth uh, hundred thousand dollars worth of therapy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like and subscribe. <laughs> One last so we thing, can yeah. race Mormon stories and get that that hundred thousand subscriber, subscribers yeah, that RFM uh, talked about at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. We will be to a hundred thousand subscribers by the end of the decade. All right, you guys, you guys <laughs> yeah. ready to close her out? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think we better get out of here. Final. <laughs> Thank words. you again, everybody. Good night. Give Brother Joseph a break. <laughs>